Hey everyone, and welcome back to Beat the Sheet, an Xbox Game Pass challenge. The only podcast aiming to complete every single one of the 480 titles that have been made available on Xbox Game Pass since the start of 2020. As always, I'm your host Andy Wood, and I'm joined by my co-host Josh. Hello, this is Josh. That is Josh. So, on this week's show, sports. <laughs> and as well as sports, sibling love goes too far in Alvastia Chronicles, and Sony goes bananas. B-A-N-E-N-A-S. That is the spelling. So, how are you doing this week, Josh? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm in a bit of a lull. I mean, I've been dragged away from my beloved Persona 5 Strikers to sod and play Alvastia Chronicles. That's going to put anybody in a bad <laughs> mood. So that, that that's hurt me a little bit. But, you know, we did our great sports episode midweek. I hope everybody checked that out. And we've been naturally shafted almost immediately by <laughs> another three sports games being added to the service, which is kind of amusing. I'm, I'm trying to see the funny side, but yeah, it's a strange week, strange week. Yeah, it's a it's one of those times where just, you know, you couldn't you couldn't write it to make it any worse for us than it has happened, you know? Like, we just off the cuff decide to do a sports special, play, frankly, way too much sports. Like, uh, yeah, if anyone's not caught that, by the way, we do have a special bonus episode that came out uh, midweek, and we reviewed 12 sports games in that. So we've really, really went hard on sports to the point where I was just completely fed up of the idea of playing sports games. And then, of course, yeah, this week, Game Pass had it's most sports filled week that we've ever seen. So that's been lovely. Um, and obviously they also paired that with some pretty huge leave and soon titles that last for tens and tens of hours. So yeah, it's uh, I'm kind of in a similar place to you. This is a, this is a rough time on the show at the moment. It's uh, yeah, we've got a lot to do and it's just all, all beating us down quite a lot. I was, I was really enjoying Final Fantasy seven. Uh, that's a game that I've kind of spoke about a little bit on the show a couple of times in the intro, and uh, it's really clicked now. You know, I had a couple of kind of non-committal talks about it before, where you asked me what my favorite character was, and I was kind of like, Ugh, I don't know, I don't care, and I, I very much care now. That that is a really, <laughs> really good game, um, and I've got about five hours left in it that I've had to shelve because sports. So, yeah, bit annoying, but but what can you do? You know, for for the sports fans out there, you know, this is this is it's been a great week for them, I'm sure. And we do like sports. I love sports oh, yeah. games. I've just I've just played about fifteen of them in the best part of a week. So, you know, <laughs> plenty of sports, but you know, let's let's just go into the show. There's actually a lot to cover, so let's do it. Okay, so we've had three new additions to the Xbox Game Pass service this week, and they are Football Manager Twenty One Xbox Edition, Madden NFL Twenty One and NBA 2K21. So, it's sports games. What do you make (laughs) of this batch of sports games? Uh, Yeah, sports. So, um, sports. That's that's one of my main points I've got to say about this set of games. Uh, But, you know, look, I mean, Football Manager is quite a cool one. Uh, This is the first time in a long while that they've actually tried to make a console version of this game because Football Manager really, it's, it's a challenge to get a management game like that to work on a console it's it's you know it the interface isn't right for it but you know they've had another go at it here which i think is the first time in about seven years that we've had a console mm-hmm. version of this game so i think game pass is a great fit for that because you know you can give it a go you know you can see if you can get past the potential control issues and, and actually enjoy the game so it's nice to be able to give that a go even for myself without buying it and sort of jumping in and you know maybe it doesn't work out so yeah that's that's a cool addition um and I mean, we have to highlight this here. The uh, the NBA 2K21 release is, is just the height of 2K's greediness, right? Because for anyone who doesn't know, this is exclusively the last-gen Xbox One edition of NBA 2K21. Um, they've, they've packaged the current-gen version, the Series X, Series S version, as NBA 2K21 next-gen as like a separate game on the store to get around it doing any kind of automatic update. So, so yeah, you don't actually get the current gen version of NBA here you just get the old one which I think is absolute garbage you know it's just it looks awful and then I mean you look at Madden NFL 21 that's came in this week that's just straight up the you know if you've got a series console you get the series version if you're on an Xbox one you get the Xbox one version so you know even coming in the same week as that game makes 2k look really bad because EA are there a company that always get maligned for you know being a bit tight with money and kind of you know scraping anything they can out of the customer and they're giving you the new version and NBA's just sat there going, nope, you're gonna just play this Xbox One version on your on your series console. So that's garbage. That's what that is. But you know, it's 2K. They're they're greedy. 
They're the big grift of a company. <laughs> I mean, you know, this this is a pretty cool week of games if you've not if you're the kind of person who loves a good yearly sports update, these games didn't come out that long ago. Madden and mm, yeah. NBA only came out in about October, November. By this is what, five, six months on, that's pretty good. These you know, these rosters are still pretty much up to date. You're playing with today's teams, which is pretty nice. I like that. That's actually kind of cool. And Football Manager 21, yeah, the Xbox version. It's interesting to see it back on console. I will highlight that the PC version of Football Manager 21 did get added to Game Pass for PC. So if you do have a game in PC, or even just a PC in general, because you don't need a lot of specs to run it, play it on that. Our review will focus on the Xbox version, but, you know, Football Manager is a PC game, and it always will be. <laughs> but let's yeah. let's start with Football Manager for the first one. This This is interesting. It is interesting that they finally brought it back to console. Do you think they should have, I guess, is the big question here. Um, yeah, yeah, I kind of do, to be honest, because um, I think it's just a big, there's a big audience of people who probably love Football Manager and maybe used to play it on a PC and, and now they don't really, you know, spend a lot of time in, in front of the PC anymore. Or, you know, maybe they just don't have a game in PC that, that can run it at like a fast enough speed that they want and stuff. So I think it's good to bring it back to consoles for a new audience. Um, and I also just think as well that consoles at this point are becoming more like you can use them more like PCs to an extent, you know? Like, one thing you can do with this game, which, you know, we won't go too much into it because I don't think it's going to be the core way a player will play it, but you can plug a mouse and keyboard into your Xbox and just use them instantly. The game just picks them up without any... There's no no menus, no loading. It just goes, oh, sure, you've got those in, and it just works. So, you know, I think because of that, it's good to have it back on console because, you know, you've kind of got the option then. If, if the controller controls are too awkward and cumbersome, then... You know, if you do have a setup where you could plug in a mouse and keyboard, it's good that that's an option now. Whereas back on the older console attempts, it was, you know, learn the controller control scheme or, you know, just stop playing. So it's good that there's more options now. And I think that warrants it coming back to console. Yeah, I, I kind of agree on the whole. I actually think they've done a pretty decent job adapting this for console. I think they've managed to make it so that you basically you push in the left stick and you get a cursor on the screen and you can basically use that as a mouse interface. And on the whole, it's pretty intuitive. It works pretty well. You can bump around some of the menus as well with the bumpers, which kind of helps if you need to and use the uh, directional pad. So the thought about how to use it and how to bring it in, there's naturally kind of teething issues with that. If you're trying to drag a player to be subbed off, you will miss it about five times out of <laughs> 10 and that's really annoying yeah. and it's pretty frustrating if you do a search and you accidentally don't click the player's name you will then miss it entirely and have to search again which on a keyboard wouldn't be the worst thing in the world but using a keyboard other controller is just mm. mind-numbingly painful <laughs> yeah so there are issues which you would just expect but to be fair to the team at football manager i think they've done a decent job here i think sports interactive have thought about it and it's it's nice to see it back because i do have memories of playing i think it was like football manager 2005 on like an xbox or something like that years yeah. ago <laughs> they used to bring them to console and i used to play them on that and so i can do it it's just it's just a slightly awkward way of going about it yeah no i think that's completely fair you know it's it's one of the tricky things of bringing this series over to console which is that you know i kind of said earlier you might get a new audience with it but i think the problem is that controlling this with a controller is it's so awkward and cumbersome that I actually think the only people who might stick out are people who have fond memories of football manager already. Like I, you know, I kind of, cause I, I was playing this and I was struggling with the same things you were that, you know, dragging stuff around the screen is incredibly awkward. And uh, the worst one for me is, I don't know if you've experienced this yet, but if you've got like two, let's say you've got like two midfielders or two defenders and you decide you want to put a third central midfielder or central defender in there, you yeah. practically can't like it, it, it literally <laughs> it took me about 30 attempts to make that formation happen because it just kept going oh you want to swap that player with the other guy and put him up there I was like that, that's not what I'm trying to do so you know I think because I know that underneath that arduous control scheme is a fantastic management game I can power through it whereas I feel like if somebody new downloads football manager xbox edition they're kind of going to spend about 15 minutes on it and just go, what the hell is this? I'm not, I'm not putting time into this. And you know, that's maybe a bit of a shame, but again, but then looking at it from the other side, I actually don't know what more you can do as well. Like I think, you know, football manager is a game full of 
menus and spreadsheets and stats pages. And there's really only so far you can go to make that work well on a controller. You know, I, I just, I think they've done about as well as they can do, but I still don't think it's good enough that, that newcomers are going to dive into it and be happy with it. I want to quickly shout out that the very first thing you do in this game is have to agree to a terms of license agreement as you do in everything <laughs> nowadays. And it just pops up a message on the screen. It says, press Y to confirm. So you press Y and you repeatedly press Y and nothing seems to be happening. So you restart the game. You think it's crashed. Nothing happens again. I did this about five times before I thought, well, I'm going to have to reinstall the game. Fortunately, I messaged you. And what it turns out you have to do is click the left stick in to get a tracker, which mm. blows my mind that nobody thought to mention that before. <laughs> I mean, there'll be people who boot up this game and just think it's fundamentally broken because unless you accidentally press the left stick in, you can't get off that menu. <laughs> and it's crazy that nobody yeah. knew I tested that. I mean, it's wild. Like, yeah, like you said, you you thought the game was broken. I restarted the game about five times. And then just by chance, I think I went to put my controller down and click the stick in. I went, oh, there's a mouse cursor. Great. And like that, that's, yeah, like that's us two. We, the, us two both thought the game was broken. So you'd have to assume a good proportion of people out there are loading this up and just going, ah, it doesn't work. And then just uninstalling it. So yeah, that's a, that's a crazy oversight. And it's not, not good messaging to start your football manager journey with. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, that's our quick PSA there. But let's talk about how the game actually plays. Now, I've kind of fell off the Football Manager series, partly because if I do get into it, I ruin my life to the point where I fear yeah. I'm going to become homeless <laughs> because all I will do is play Football Manager. I couldn't, I can't install this on a PC because I won't work. If I have the option to just <laughs> click on it, I will just do it. So for my own safety, I can't do that. I'm already going to uninstall this game almost immediately. Otherwise, Beat the Sheet will just turn into Beat the Champions League with Hull City. And that will be that yeah. for the next two to three years. So there's a <laughs> there's a duty of care here. But it's pretty addictive stuff. It still really hooks its claws into you very early on. There's something integrally satisfying about just putting a squad together, putting your tactics in. There's a lot of depth here, which I just delegate to my assistant manager all the time because I don't want to get too into the systems. Mm. But just the core enjoyment of you know signing a couple of players, sticking them into the team and hoping for the best, is it's kind of fun. It's still enjoyable stuff to play through. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And they've, they've done some good stuff in this over the recent years. I mean, I've been out of the... I haven't played the full versions of Football Manager since about 2014. Uh, I was looking at my, uh, my Steam account on my PC, and I can see that, like... I think 2011, 2012, and 2013, I combined about a thousand hours on those. And then I think, I think it's time so that as I left university and had to get a job, I stopped buying it because I knew that I wouldn't be able to play it properly anymore. So it's been a while since I've I've played it. And uh, yeah, you know, they've added some cool stuff here. Like there's there's stuff now where when you choose to sign for a club, the club has like a long term vision of what they wanted to achieve, which is is new to me. Um, and that's that's pretty great. So like. You can see that your club, you know, maybe you're going to survive in your league this year, but then within two or three years, they want you to get promoted or, or at least make like the playoffs or something. And, you know, they want you to have a fairly good like cup run or win a cup maybe and stuff. And I, I think that's really cool. Like, because Football Manager used to be that you just signed your contract to get your club and then, you know, you just you just played it. And maybe if you're doing bad, they tell you, oh, you, you suck, you're probably going to get fired soon. Whereas now you've actually got these set goals of, of, you know, what they think you should achieve over a few years. And I, I think that's really cool. Um, and I also think that the game has come a long way in having some quite good, um, like, data analysis stuff in there that helps you helps you see what's happening in a match without actually needing to, like, do a ton of work yourself. Um, like, there's this new stat in particular, which is, is kind of came into the world of football as well as Football Manager recently, which is this expected goal stat, which is, like, XG. And, like, that thing is great because it basically it kind of like tells you, it analyzes all the shots you've taken in a game and tells you how many goals you you should have been expected to score from those added together. So like, I mean, it's good, but also it's a double-edged sword because it makes you even more angry at the game sometimes, you know? Like I lost a match 3-1 earlier and the expected goal staff my team was that we should have scored four goals and the other team should have scored (laughs) one. And I was like, we lost 3-1, but we should have been, it should have been 4-1 to us. Like what the hell's happened there? But, you know, stuff like that's really good because you can can adapt your team and kind of see how it affects that start and, you know, try and and like get results that way rather than, you know, in the past you used to just kind of have to stare at like, 
all of these over the overly kind of intensive charts and like heat maps to see what was happening. Whereas I think they've came a long way in making it a bit more accessible to make tweaks based on like bigger data, which is, you know, I'm, I'm sure this sounds incredibly boring to people who don't play football manager, but if you have any interest in the series, this stuff's, this stuff's really cool. I like it a lot. Well, yeah, exactly. And the assistant manager will pop up with advice and say, you need to mark this guy closer. And it's just a push of a button for them to do it. That's pretty cool. It's nice to have the assistant manager actually be useful rather than in the past, they were just uh, to take over mm. training more than anything else. Yeah. So it's nice to have them <laughs> actually get involved in games themselves. You know, there's there's just a lot of information here. There's a lot of menus. There's a lot of stuff to click through. The only problem with that on the console version is Football Manager is a game about menus and information. And if navigating menus and finding information is fundamentally a bit of a chore, it makes you not want to do that. So, for example, whenever I get to a team, I just click quick pick. And then if they don't put some players in, in the positions I want, I then have to drag everybody. And it's a pain. It takes ages. Yeah. So I tend to just never change the team or just <laughs> accept whatever happens, even if my best player is now on the bench. I just go, well, <laughs> what are you going to do? Let's live it yeah. up. I mean, it's there's elements of that which lead it frustrating. But as you say, the court is the actual game-to-game play is just really fun. You still find yourself screaming. When you're losing four one to yeah, I get I get, so, I get so angry at Football Manager. It's it's ridiculous. No other game makes me this angry because I feel like I feel like when these players aren't doing well, it's it's a slight on me, you know. Like <laughs> like, and I mean another thing with the way I play Football Manager quickly is um, I have this thing where the only way I'll play this game is I start unemployed. Like most of the advertising for this game would sort of suggest that you know you're gonna like take over like a big massive club and you know, spend millions to make them like the absolute best team in the world. I refuse to do that. I just start off unemployed and I I join whichever team will have me, which is always in the worst league available. So like, so yeah, I spent my last few days managing Spenny Muir Town and inevitably I, what, what happens is I just end up absolutely hating what is essentially a real world part-time like 35 year old man who plays for Spenny Muir Town because, you know, he didn't score a goal in 10 games and I got sacked. So now I hate him. And like, it's just, it's just ridiculous because he's obviously just an actual man who plays this part time while he's probably, you know, a plumber in his other job. And I, I'm sat here actively screaming at a representation of my TV because he just keeps missing absolute sitters every game. And it's just, yeah, football manager affects me in a way other games don't. <laughs> it's just the way to play. And so I started up as Hull City, which is my team in real life, because I wanted to just know the squad and know what I needed to do so I could yeah. get straight into it. And I find myself just hating players I love in real life. Like, <laughs> Hull City has a wonderful young centre-half called Jacob Greaves, who his dad played for the club, and we all love him. And he nice. gave away a penalty in Football Manager, and I fined him £2,000, and I didn't even think twice. <laughs> I was just <laughs> livid with him for giving oh, away yeah. this penalty. And he accepted his fine with good grace, which is good, because if he didn't, I'd have fined him again. So <laughs> it's, just, it's just Football Manager does something terrible to you where yeah, you it, hate her almost instantly i run every club i play through fear and fear a lot like you'll hear i love the the game always does this you have like press conferences and say oh this manager said this that so and so and so about you how do you respond and you can have really passive and easygoing messages and then there's always the message well we're all gonna fuck them up at the weekend and you <laughs> always pick it because it just angers you yeah why wouldn't you and then i mean this game as well has a it has a new thing to me at least where in the matches you can now you can now shout from the, the touchline at, like, at the team. So like you've got options to like shout to encourage them or shout to like fire them up or tell them to focus or stuff like that. But one of the options is just to berate the entire team. And the <laughs> amount of times I just press berate, it's just constant. Like I just, I just, I just constantly am just angry at this stupid team. Like, you know, again, the expected goal stat said we should win, not lose. Like, what are you doing? useless bastards <laughs> it's, it's just one of those games and it's still really fun for them. oh god you, it is yeah and when you go on a winning streak you feel like god when you come from 2-0 down to win 3-2 with an 89th minute winner you find it hard to explain to your significant other while you're literally running around the house yeah with just <laughs> glee that you've managed you've not even done anything and then you come back to the screen and you drew 3-3 because you conceded <laughs> in the 96th minute and then you throw your control on the floor just Berate, berate, berate. Yes, it's all you can do. <laughs> it's and the only it's way. Great for that. It's great for that. I, I do love this game. I will probably put some more hours into it. I don't think this is the best way to play it. I, I really no, think no. you should play it on PC. I think they've done the best they can here. And if there's no other option available to you, 
and you want to play a football management game because you want to bring on an early heart attack induced by stress and anger, <laughs> then this is the way to play it. But, you know, it's it's a PC game. It's available on Game Pass for PC. If you can do it that way, do it that way. And then you yeah. can just throw your laptop at the wall rather than a controller, which is much yeah. more satisfying. Exactly. That's that sounds that sounds like a good idea. So I mean, yeah, going back briefly to like you said, you know, the, the controls on this are rough. It's not easy to play like that. But at the same time, if you do for whatever reason have a setup where you can comfortably plug a mouse and keyboard into your Xbox, it works well. I mean, I've I started using a mouse at least today. I didn't bother putting a keyboard in because I thought a mouse would be sufficient, but I started using a mouse because I got to a point where like because I'm playing as like a lower league team, the entire team was out of contract in about three months time. So I had to get them all <laughs> to sign new contracts. And I was like, I am not navigating these menus with a, like analog stick for a mouse cursor. Like I can't do it. So I plugged the mouse in and yeah the game just instantly picks it up. It's fine. And then I just you know I got through that really quickly and then I started just doing a kind of thing where you know any any menu stuff I'd use the mouse and then once I'm in a match I'll maybe just use the controller to be lazier and stuff and it works fine it, it really does um and also as well if you play the Xbox edition of Football Manager you can bring that save between the PC and the Xbox so there's some portability there which is quite nice um as well so you know that's pretty good um at the same time, though, as well, the the full fat version of Football Manager is also on Game Pass on PC. So you've got the choice there. You can play the Xbox edition, which is it's a it's a stripped down version. But I wouldn't, I I don't think it's that stripped down. I actually think it's, I think this version strikes a really good balance. I think it's it's got enough depth that you can do a lot of stuff, but also it it runs by quite quickly. Like the fully featured version of Football Manager. Sometimes you can spend about six hours and you've you've not played your first league game yet. So I actually think the Xbox edition zips along at a good pace. But yeah, tons of football manager options in Game Pass right now. You can play this one on your console, this one on your PC, or the full one on your PC. So that's all good stuff. Yes, it's just all there, isn't it? There's just I love the there's a few other things which just because this game is all about just getting angry, which just, oh, just God, induce yeah. anger in me. <laughs> For example, my board who are assholes in real life and are assholes in the game. So we got to the third round of the League Cup against Premier League Leicester, and we lost 4-2. I thought it was a decent performance. You know, we scored a couple of goals. Yeah. And they were pissed at me for losing 4-2 against Leicester. I thought, we're bloody League One. What is <laughs> so, You know, the, the joy of people above you also being annoying, so you take it out on the people below you. It's the real corporate structure brought to life. I kind yeah. of love that. I also love the fact that now all the games have pre-match tweets which have ended and you'll recognize people sometimes they go, this guy's playing Wilkes today. What is he thinking? I'm thinking he's our top scorer, mate. That's what I'm thinking. What, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> so now I'm getting angry at fake social media accounts. <laughs> you know, this, yeah, this, I is, mean, this is what it's got to. I mean, you know, it's just bad. <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect representation of what Twitter is though, right? They've, they've nailed it really. It's just, yeah, a bunch of people getting grumpy about your team and then you hate them. That's that's completely normal. So yeah, it's again, it's football manager is such a weird one because it's, it's such an all-encompassing game. Like, it will make you incredibly angry, but also, as you said earlier, like if you score a last minute equalizer or winner, there's no other game that will make me that excited. Like any game where I'm controlling the players myself, there's not the same level of 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 you know passion involved. Whereas when it's these stupid Spenny Moo Town players, like when one of them is managing to somehow score a goal, I'm just over the moon. Not anymore because they did sack me because they're a bunch of dicks. But nonetheless, <laughs> you know, I'm now at, I'm now um, I'm now at Dorking Wanderers. That's my new job. So gonna give that a go later on and then probably uninstall the game like you have because it's the only way that i'll be safe but um but yeah look football manager is fantastic um i've decided to give the specifically this console version a seven out of ten um i i genuinely think that the game underneath it is an eight or nine out of ten game but i have to factor in that most people are gonna be trying to play this you know sat sat on a comfy chair or on the couch with a controller in the hands. And this is not an ideal experience for that. You know, it's it's really rough trying to manage these screens with a controller. So yeah, I had to drop it to a seven, but Football Manager as a whole is a fantastic experience. I, I, I love it. I'm going to play a little bit more before I give it a firm score, but I'd probably lean towards a six. I, I actually think it's the game itself, as you say, is an eight or nine. And if you like management sims, it's a 10 because yeah. there's just nothing wrong with it. But I imagine the thing about football managers, you're meant to play it for hundreds of hours. And I can't imagine playing this for hundreds of hours because it's just going to irk and grind on me more and more and more. So six out of 10 for the version, eight out of 10 for the game itself. Do check it out, especially if you're 
intrigued by why anybody would play a football management <laughs> game. It's it's a novelty, if nothing else. Yeah, that sounds that sounds fair. Okay, moving on to our next game, which is Madden NFL 21. Now, if you listen to our sports special midweek, we only very, very recently played Madden 20, and neither of us were massively enamored by it. We thought it was okay, but lacking in quite a lot. So did Madden 21 change your opinion on this game, or do you still not really care for it too much? Yeah, Madden 21 is a weird one, because if I put both of these games side by side, I actually... I think they're very, very comparable because, you know, of course they are. It's a yearly sports update. Um, Madden NFL 21 has the advantage that this is a, a series version. You know, you get a series XRS version, which does look a bit nicer. But other than that, this is just more Madden. And yet at the same time, I weirdly, I got more into this one. And I don't think it's particularly because it does anything that much better. I think I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting a bit more used to the Madden, Madden experience. But I don't know. I had, a, I had an okay time with this. I had a very similar thing to you in that there is literally no real difference between this game and Madden 20. It's pretty much the same. I I didn't notice a single new gameplay feature. They didn't tell me to do anything new. It was the same game. But because I've played more Madden now, I kind of enjoy playing Madden more now because I've gotten used (laughs) to it. I've just gotten into it more. I also think the career mode in this, the rise of the uh, face of the franchise it's called, is better put together than what they put in for Madden 20, which was as bare bones as possible. This does have a overarching story. It's a story you get bored of in about two hours, <laughs> but it does have a story and it, it kind of themes each of its seasons, which is quite cool. So as mm. you play through your career, and you don't play every game, you just play key moments, which is a nice idea as well. So you may be a rookie in an NFL team and you're trying to just get one game to make an impression. And you've got to make it count in that game. And that's pretty cool. And it ties into the story. Next year, you might be starting now and you've got to solidify your place. And it's just adding these little themes to each season. You, know, you get an injury and you need to come back and prove you can still do it. You've got a rivalry in your division. Little simple stories, but it tells them pretty well. It tells them mainly through voiced dialogue. And it's, it's kind of an engaging way to play through a career. I ended up retiring as the greatest of all time. I just played all of it. Wow. So it must have hooked me somewhat. No, no, that's fair. Yeah, I do think the career is better this time. Um, I've I've only played to the point where I made the NFL and then I played a few games after that. But even the lead up to it, I think, is is a lot better. Um, it gives you a bit more options this time as well. Like you can, you can play as a, a receiver if you want to rather than the quarterback. And they actually kind of give you an option to... There's one season where you can choose whether or not you want to like try a season as a different role or if you want to just stick with your current role or, you know, stuff like that. You can choose whether to move on to the NFL a year earlier or stick it out in college for longer. You know, there's there's some variation there. And I, I do like that. You know, the, the story itself, I mean, this is a sports, a yearly sports game with a story mode. So it's obviously just a, a cliche riddled mess because that's, that's just what these things are. Uh, there's some strange kind of bromance relationship that they just drop when they get sick of it as you said <laughs> they just they make a big point of it and show you all these cutaways of real people talking about the the heartbreak kids which is you and this other guy and then you make it to the nfl and they literally forget it happened um and you know it's got some other stuff like when you get to college they have like the the you know you're, you're obviously a, an offensive player because you're a quarterback and they have the typical coach who's like I'm just going to rely on my defense and I, I just want you to keep it simple and not do anything, you know, anything risky, but then actually you can do whatever you want once you're in the game. So it really doesn't matter anyway. It's uh, it's, you know, it's the usual sports game fair, but as I said, for whatever reason, I, I got into it a bit more. I, I, I really, you know, I quite liked playing this. Yeah. As you say, they do to the story of the heartbreak kids and it is kind of fun. Your, your quarterback rival has a heart condition and so I kept spending the entire game going, when's he going to die? I was I was kind of <laughs> looking forward to it, but he never did. And I expected to like face him in the Super Bowl like years hmm. down the line. I thought, well, that's an obvious story. Of course they're going to do that. Credit to them for just not. I mean, <laughs> it's, just, yeah. you know, it's, like, Some, it's sports. Sometimes these things don't work out. You'll you know? literally <laughs> never see the guy again. It blew my mind. I just assumed we would come. He probably, he probably did die. Like, Maybe he did. And I just yeah. give a solitary crap. But, you know. <laughs> So that, so that was kind of a little bit strange. But yeah, on the whole, it's pretty entertaining. I mean, this it's well acted enough. There's a weird thing that once you get into the main career, a lot of text boxes start appearing. And that just feels really cheap for a Madden game. 
I feel mm. like, can't you voice every bit of dialogue, EA? I mean, for God's sake, you've got more money than Creases. We don't need you to be sodding, putting text to box dialogues up. Just voice it all. It's, it's just struck me as a little bit out of place that they suddenly dropped all the voice acting. But, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's pretty entertaining. It's a pretty decent game. And I also found out how to not play any of the defensive part of the game, which <laughs> improved it 10 times for me. I only played an offense, and that kind of made it more fun because whatever the defense did, whether they did a good stop or they let a touchdown in, I had to respond to. So that kind of made it a bit more fun for me as well. Yeah, I ended up doing that as well. I I just played the offensive plays because, one, I I can't possibly enjoy the the defense in this game, and two, it just made it feel more like a career mode. You know, like I shouldn't be able to control that side of the game. I should be, I should be, you know, dealing with whatever hand I'm dealt. And if, if we're behind by 14 because of the defense aren't making any stops, then it's on me to, you know, to sort that out. I think that's a better way of playing it anyway for me. But, but you know, the, the defensive side of it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, we we said on the sports special, um, I actually said, you know, if anyone does enjoy playing defense in these games, you know, let us know because I, I can't possibly understand how it's fun. And, uh, you know, we got some responses to that. And uh, one of our responses was from uh, JD from Vancouver, who, who sent us a great email in. And he was saying that, you know, the key to it really is that when you understand those different defense types, right? When you know the difference between a zone and a man and a blitz defense, you can actually start being quite strategic about, you know, you're trying to figure out what the offense is going to play. So you're going to counter it with a certain defense pick. And I can see that being fun. And I guess we're just going to always be hampered by the fact that we're never going to understand the sport in that to that level, are we? Like it's realistically over here in the UK where nobody cares about NFL. We're just, we're never going to get that, but that's kind of fine. You know, as I said, I, I enjoy just being the offense side and just trying to you know make do with what situations i get left in so it's fine for that and you know I, it's good to see that some people enjoy the defense too so that's that's good <laughs> yeah yeah shout out to jd for that one been to vancouver love vancouver lovely city do go uh, anybody else who is listening very clean it's a strange thing to say but it's a very clean city <laughs> it's, it's very nice but he's right and they actually got me thinking about the defensive part of the game and what would work for me particularly in multiplayer games is that element of rock paper scissors Whatever yeah. you pick, you need to counter with what they do. And because you don't know what each play was running, it, it can either combust beautifully or be a wonderful stop. And I imagine that's actually kind of fun. Soul Calibur Six did a similar thing of all games where you could go into high, low or middle combat fins halfway through it. And depending on what you picked, you could turn the tide of the fight. Depending on what defensive play you pick, you can turn the tide of the match. And that's kind of cool. I think that works really well in a multiplayer game. So a good email that got me thinking about actually how this could be quite a fun system to play. I yeah. admittedly, I still couldn't do anything beyond just rush the quarterback and hope for the best. That's, that's yeah. literally as good as I can do. That's literally, that's all I can do. Um, I mean, that was that was another thing JD actually mentioned. He said, you know, that when when you have the opportunity to play Madden with like friends who understand the sport really well, that helps you kind of get better at the game and understand the defense side more. And like, obviously, again, that's just not something we're ever going to have available to us over here in the UK. Like, we're all just a bunch of idiots just throwing, throwing Hail Mary passes and hoping for the best and not understanding any aspect of what's happening. So... You know, it's just not an avenue that's available to us, but but still, it's it seems well put together for what it is. It, it is, I and mean, it's pretty well done. I'll say, on the whole, I preferred this version of Madden, even though I think it's the exact same game as last year. I think this is just familiarity. I've gotten used to the series more. I really quite got into it. I enjoyed throwing great passes, just storming for a touchdown. It's really satisfying to do when it comes together well. The presentation's great. It plays yeah. pretty well on Series X and S consoles. The loading times are a bit killer, but on the whole, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think this is a pretty good game. I'd still only give it a six. I, I don't think it's any better, but I enjoyed it a lot more. That six last time was just that I get what it's doing. I, I It's just not for me. This is more of a, actually, this is pretty fun. And if they could just tighten it up a little bit, I think they could make a really fun version of this game. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. I also gave this a six. Um, I gave Madden 20 a five, but I do agree with you. I actually think they're largely exactly the same game. I'm just becoming more used to it. So in retrospect, that five is probably a little bit harsh on Madden 20. But but yeah, I think this is a six out of 10 game. I, um, I, I enjoyed my time with it. And I think, you know, hopefully now that they're in the next gen world and the next one can be a full next gen release, they can, you know, start making some improvements, maybe just across the board and, and you know, maybe it can get better from here. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on to our next game, which is NBA 2K21. 
Now, again, in our sports special, we mentioned that basketball was a little bit harshly done by because it was represented by NBA Live 19, (laughs) an objectively bad game, which, you know, isn't the best representation of basketball you can play. One week later, they bring in what is probably the best version of basketball you can play, which is the 2K series. Now, we've both managed to spend a bit of time with this. We've both played through a good chunk of the career. How much better is 2K to NBA Live? Or do you actually think maybe there's not that much difference at all? You know, I think it's a really tricky one because I think I think NBA 2K is the far better series. I think the, the basketball mechanically is is in a different league to what NBA Live is. And obviously... You know, we're judging NBA Live 19 here. That is now a three-year-old game. EA will be back eventually with a new version and it'll be a fairer contest then. But it is this is fundamentally a much better game. And yet I also think that to enjoy NBA 2K at a good level, you need to really, really get what it is, uh, particularly on the defensive side. I think, you know, you need to run all of the tutorials and really figure out how to how to respond to everything to actually make it any good. Because if you don't do that, it's actually quite a tedious game. Um, you know, it's, and again, I, I, like I said, mechanically, it's fantastic, but I don't have a lot of fun playing NBA 2K. It has to be said. I, I, I don't know. I just, whereas NBA Live was quite a floaty arcade representation of basketball, you know, it was still, still a simulation. We're not talking like NBA Street. It was still a simulation type game, but it felt a bit floatier and easier to play. Whereas this is, you know, if you don't know what you're doing in NBA 2K, it's, it's pretty rough to be honest. Um, And the career mode is the main thing that highlights that as well, because the worst part of NBA is playing as a bad player. If you're a bad player in an NBA game, you just suck so much that it's like, (laughs) it's infuriating trying to play the game because these career modes insist on starting you with like this 50 rated character. And, you know, the NBA, everyone in the NBA is like worlds better than that. And even when you play through the career in this, you go through high school and college, like, you know, them players aren't NBA level, sure, but, also, you can't score to save your life because your shooting stats about 40 out of 100. So you just miss all the time. And, you know, and then even though this career is meant to be about you becoming an awesome NBA player, the commentary are like, well, he's shitting me. Like, he can't, he can't, do, <laughs> can't do anything. Like, it's, you know, so there's, yeah, there's frustrations here. I mean, I think if you're, if you're a super fan, this is, this is more awesome basketball. But if you're not, I just don't think this is an easy series to enjoy. I've been racking my mind trying to think. Because I played NBA 2K20. I played NBA Live 19. And I couldn't get on board with either of them. And I was trying to think why. And it kind of clicked for me halfway through NBA 2K21. I fundamentally don't like playing basketball in a video game. It's one of those sports which I don't think converts realistically well to video games. Mm. It's, it's too goddamn tedious. And it's too miserable. I mentioned to hark back to our sports special once more. That basketball is a weird sport because most of the time, everybody's real good at it and they score all the time. And so you're waiting for somebody to not score. Well, I'll give you a clue. In NBA 2K21, the person who wouldn't (laughs) score was me every single time. It did not matter what I did because my player who runs like treacle and shoots like his arm is broken just refuses (laughs) to get any level of basket. And it didn't matter whether I was using the stick controls where you flip back and flick forward. That would always veer to the right. Even when I was looking at my movements, it would still say I veered to the right. So I just gave up on that and went to the button presses. It didn't matter what I did. Could never perfect a decent throw on this. And even when I was a fraction out, I'd miss. And I'd just scream. Just like, what more do you want from me? (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) I'm like... Stood on my knees, just begging it to let me get a basket. Just one basket. It's all I wanted. And it just wouldn't let me. And this is, well, get back on defense, which you do. And you foul because you had the audacity to try to steal the ball, which apparently you should just never do in a basketball game. (laughs) And then it says, well, why don't you just try and block it? And you do. And you jump about seven seconds after you press to jump and it goes in. And then your in game scorecard, which means like C at the start, goes down to F. And it just goes, you're just a <laughs> fucking loser. It might as well just put that in the talk <laughs> uh, <laughs> by the time I finish. It's just, yeah. it's so demoralizing to play. I can't get on board with authentic sim versions of basketball. Mm. It's just a sport which lends itself to the arcade so much better. No, that's entirely fair. I mean, I so I played through the full career to the point where you get to the NBA. And uh, for what it's worth, it's 
actually quite fully featured this time. Uh, NBA 2K20s took about 90 minutes before you, you <laughs> kind of, you rolled credits and then you're in the NBA. Whereas this thing takes a good kind of five or six hours. Uh, you know, it's got a, it's got a story to it. You kind of, you know, you go from high school to college. It's got a Michael K. Williams in it as like your mentor because every NBA game needs someone from the wire to be in it. So, you know, <laughs> He's he's making the obligatory the wire contribution to this game, and uh, you know it's it's fine. It's again it's a sports game story, so it's really cheesy. At one point, your guy gets a girlfriend, and he cha- he like he runs to the train station before a train leaves because they had an argument, and he needs to like patch things up. You know, it's real kind of just generic melodrama stuff. But yeah, you know the it's it's fine. At least there's some content there that leads you towards the NBA. Um, but yeah, again. Being a bad player in these games is brutal. It really is. I mean, I kind of had to do something on mine where, because I was playing as a point guard, so obviously, you know, you do some scoring, but you're also assisting assisting people to get, you know, you get your assists up and stuff. And I, I just had to only do assists for about the first eight games because <laughs> I knew I'd miss shots. So, like... So I was getting like air ratings from the like coach thing. It was like, oh yeah, you know, great game. You got an air there. You you know, you got your like 12 assists and maybe I scored two points. And like, you know, that's the fair enough. I was getting the air, but then what wasn't very nice is that even though it said I got an A, every time I finished those games, the game would act as if I did a shit job. And I think it was because I wasn't scoring. So like, the commentary team would be like, oh, well, they, they they won the game easily, but it, you know, it was no thanks to Junior. He, you know, he had a really disappointing performance today and hopefully he can fix that next time. It's like, I assisted about half of the points. Like, I, I had a great performance. This is exactly what I should be doing. Like, it's, so that was frustrating. That that annoyed me a lot. Um, eventually, once I got my character to the point where he could occasionally score, I did start doing some, you know, getting some points and then they liked me again. But I don't know. That seemed weird. Like I should be, I should be rewarded for things that aren't just points. You know, it is basketball. It's a, it's a more rounded game than that. So yeah, I don't know. It's got its problems. And, you know, again, I mean, we spoke earlier on about how 2K, are, you know, a bit greedy and they, they grift a lot. And obviously this is just the last gen version of the game, which is disappointing. And another thing that's disappointing is the way you get your character to be better in this game, which is, you know, you play games and you get like, I don't know what the money's called, but you get like 2K money, some 2K dollars, and you have to spend the 2K dollars to get your stats up. You know, it's not a natural sports thing where you actually just get better by using abilities. No, no, you got you got to spend your 2K bucks. And obviously, you know, you don't become better at an acceptable rate in this game. You know, like when you reach the NBA, you're about 15 points worse on average than an NBA player. So your choice is to either just grind it out and be awful at the game for about four seasons of basketball, or you know, and you know, two K won't won't uh, be shy about telling you that maybe if you just pass them fifteen quid, you can get some two K money, and uh, and ramp those stats up really quickly. And you know, that's just I hate to see that. You know, it's these career modes should be a single player introduction to what the game is going to be. They shouldn't be about saying, you know, maybe give us an extra fifteen quid and you can be a good player. I just really, really dislike that. Yeah, it's it's really scummy, and it's part of the reason why it makes you miss so much is to encourage you to spend money so you get less bad. Because by the end of it, I was practically getting my debit card out, thinking, "Please <laughs> let me score. I'll pay you what you want if you let me <laughs> score one free point shot. Please, just one. It's all I ask." So it works. It works because they just then. So basically, two K twenty one is the version of negging you. It's, it's the old <laughs> dating version of just going, well, you're crap, aren't you? you you're not good yeah. enough for me unless you spend all this money. And you, you kind of feel like you have to in the end because they've broke you down to a worthless shell of your former self. NBA, <laughs> like, a session with NBA 2K21 makes me hate myself more than anything in the world. It just I just <laughs> love my entire existence by the time this yeah. game has finished. Yeah, this, this NBA 2K21 makes me feel about myself how Football Manager 21 makes me feel about other players of football. You know, it's like, I have that anger, but it's all internal because I just can't score. Like I'm, I'm at the free fall line and I'm a point guard and I hit the cursor right in the middle where I meant to hit. And I've only got like a 40% chance of it working. And it's like, what? what? Like, why? No no player would only have a 40% chance of a free throw if he, if he shot it perfectly. Like, why is my man just the worst player who's ever existed? Like, it's just, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's it's just really, yeah, really bad form. And I, I, just, I just find it incredibly frustrating. And yeah, I mean, outside of the career mode, I don't know how much time you spent with the other stuff, but you know, you've got your typical modes. You've got your kind of franchise thing where you control the team and, 
you know, make trades and, and make make the team you want to make and stuff. And that's it's perfectly serviceable. Um, and then obviously you've got your ultimate team, you know, collect trading cards mode because every sports game has to have a trading card mode at this point. Uh, NBA's feels particularly like it's like it's almost forgot what it is at this point. Like I remember reading a press release about this when uh, they added it to Game Pass and it was talking about like, you're going to get a, a Sapphire level LeBron James card and you can evolve it to a platinum LeBron card by doing these quests. And I was like, this literally sounds like an actual trading card game. It sounds like I'm playing like Hearthstone or Pokemon trading card game. Like it's, it's gone too far. Like I don't know. I don't know what this is anymore. It just, it just has to stop Josh. I mean, if LeBron got, like, flamethrower at the end of it and he could just shoot flames <laughs> out of his mouth or, you know, poison, just any good poke, hydro thunder just smashes it out. <laughs> that would be great. I'd be all in for that. Hydro pump, I should have said. That yeah. would have been fantastic. But instead, it's it's not that. It's just grifty 2K all over again. Yeah. I just think the problem with this game is, as you say, you're terrible. Everybody knows you're terrible. And yet the story plays so very straight. I think yeah. you can make a very enjoyable game where you play as somebody who quite clearly is not good enough for the <laughs> NBA and yet has managed to make his way here. Every time you come on the pitch, a horn could play going, dur, 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 dur. <laughs> just, just, you know, just mocking in toads, just like your daddy has paid for you to get this job and you prove them all wrong by scoring 10, 10 points in a game one time or something. You, know? <laughs> you, can have like just... the, you can have like the whole crowd just negging you for the whole game, like doing like <laughs> doing like doing almost like a Kurt Angle-style You Suck chant. Just every bit of music, <laughs> yes. just You Suck. Yeah, like they might as well, because that's how good you are at the game when you play through it. I just... Oh, they might as well give you a dedicated button to fall flat on your face. Just <laughs> They might as well. Like I'd rather do that. Then try and say that I'm actually NBA good enough, despite the fact I'm about a hundred times worse than an NBA player would be. Yeah. So yeah, look, NBA 2K21. If you love basketball games, then this is fine. But I just can't anymore. I've played three <laughs> basketball games now, and I just I can't take them anymore. I'm so sick of this sport. Remake NBA Jam. And I'll talk to you. But for now, I'm just going to park this, say it's a five and just move away as far as I can. Yeah, that's that's entirely fair. I mean, look, I've gave this a six out of 10 here. I think I gave 2K20 the same. Um, you know, these are ratings based on people who aren't obsessive over these games. I, I do believe that, the like I said, the mechanics of the 2K series, if you are a, a huge, huge 2K fan, a huge basketball fan, this can be a much better game for you than it is for us. You know, that's, that's undoubtable. But at the same time, yeah, if you're not, if you're not that already, I don't, I just can't massively recommend that you, you rush into this game. Like, you know, between this and Madden, you know, we obviously reviewed both of them this week between this and Madden. And even though NFL is a more complex sport, that's difficult to understand. I would say if you had no experience in either of those sports, actually play Madden instead of NBA, which is, is pretty wild, you know, like, because you'll never understand how defense works in Madden. And I still think you'll have more fun as an amateur level player than you would ever have trying to play this game. I just think 2K is just, it's just real rough until you absolutely nail how to play. Absolutely, completely agree with that. Play Madden, that's much more fun. Okay, moving on to our leaving soon games. Now, we have four titles announced here, all of which will be leaving on the 15th of March. So you've got a week to go. And they are Alvastia Chronicles, Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night, Kona, and The Witcher Free Wild Hunt. Now, there's a big shining red flag right in the middle of this one. <laughs> I mean, this is this is a bad batch for me anyway, because I'd only played one of these games, and spoiler, it was the short one. But <laughs> this, the the Witcher Three man, that's a good god. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the only response that's appropriate for this one. I mean, you know, we've had uh, we've had talks off show before, um, you know, when we're not on the podcast about how sometimes it feels like Game Pass, or maybe maybe the the sheet itself, you know, the Google sheet that has all the games on, is some kind of entity that actually lives and tries to screw us over at different turns and 
I can't help but feel between, you know, between the sports week just after the sports special and then the addition of The Witcher to the Leaving Soon titles that we are absolutely being punished like here. You know, you <laughs> you talk too much about Persona 5 Strikers. That's not a Game Pass game. And and we're paying the price. You know, this is this is the kind of punishment we get. Now we have to play The Witcher in two weeks while also playing three other games. It's it's a brutal set of Leaving Soon titles. This is uh, This is definitely one of our more challenging weeks. It's just an it's been a nightmare for me. I mean, I hadn't played all Bastia Chronicles. That takes seven hours to beat. Bloodstain takes about ten hours to beat. So I haven't even started The Witcher 3 yet. I've not even <laughs> installed it. Like oh, you'd played no. a bit, you'd played like 15 hours of The Witcher 3 before it even popped up. I've got zero hours on The Witcher 3. I've had to take Monday off just to spend <laughs> eight hours trying to play some of The Witcher 3. I can't beat it in a week. I mean, of course I can't. We all know I can't. Fortunately, I own a copy of it. So I'll play it. I'll hopefully beat it. But the chances are I'm not going to finish an 80-hour game in a week. It it, (laughs) it just seems pretty unlikely. But, I mean, good God, what an absolute train wreck of a leaving soon patch this is for me. Yeah, no, it's tough. I mean, as you said, yeah, you know, luckily, I mean, I own The Witcher 3 as well. So I'm I'm going to be pushing to finish it because obviously we'll be reviewing it on next week's show. So definitely want to get that done. And I, I think I can manage it because I already was quite a ways through it. But but yeah, I think in your case, it's just going to have to be a case, isn't it? Of just, yeah, hammer out as much as you can. And then if you know, if you if you need a couple more days after the after the uh, podcast date, then that's it's just there's no other choice. I mean, it's too long. It's it's crazy. Absolute nightmare. But we're going to review this week the three smaller games, which are Bastia, Bloodstained, and Kona. The Witcher 3, I mean, I couldn't review it now if I tried. All I can say is it's got Geralt in it. Fine, I don't know. So we're going to go with the, <laughs> we'll go with the three main games for this week. And we'll kick off with Alvastia Chronicles. Now, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, this game is absolutely wild. I uh, I played this forever ago. Um, I, I mean, quick, like, beat the sheet trivia here but um i actually talked about this on a trial episode of this show that we made before we launched the real show so there is a version of beat the sheet where i talk about this game that went out to about three people to check we weren't absolutely awful at doing podcasts so um, so yeah i've spoken about this before and yeah it is a it's just a mad weird little trashy rpg right like this this is made by a studio that just kind of churn out tons and tons of, of rpgs onto mainly onto mobile and yet, for some reason, this one is on Game Pass. <laughs> and it's it's completely baffling as to why. Yeah, it makes literally no sense. Kemco, who are the developers of this game, as you mentioned, they play they produce about develop about seven or eight games a year. Like that's just what they do. They churn them out. And I have no idea why, of all games, this was selected to come to Game Pass. Did <laughs> did somebody fall asleep at the wheel or something when this got added? To, I mean, why would you pay money for this? I mean, did they just put it up for free and nobody noticed? I mean, it's absolutely I mean, bizarre. Maybe, honestly, like maybe, you know, because I've seen a thing before saying that apparently like the actual deals companies make for Game Pass are incredibly like fluid, you know, like there's some are some are like upfront money, some are some are like deals based on game, like how much time they spend on the game, or you know, maybe it's um well, you know, there's different kind of deals there. And you have to wonder if maybe maybe Chemco, being that they're a company that released about 500 games a year. Maybe they didn't really get much or, you know, anything for this. And it's just a visibility kind of deal, right? Like maybe it's, you know, get this in Game Pass, show people what they can do. And, and you know, maybe you'll pick up a few more sales on the on the mobile games, you know, like there could be something like that. Because I can't see a world where Microsoft have, you know, put, took like the truck of money to Chemco headquarters and been like, we need Alvastia Chronicles. <laughs> like it's, it hasn't happened, does it? So yeah, very, very strange one. It's it's a bizarre game. It's a JRPG, and it's not a bad game. Like this is the strangest thing about this. It's not really terrible. It's a budget game designed for you know diehard fans of the genre who just cannot get enough of JRPGs. Probably best played on a mobile phone. It doesn't really. It just shouldn't be on an Xbox. It it should be played on your phone. That the entire mobile system of this game is still very much clear in its interface. It's all over the shop. You can see all how all of this would translate to a touch screen just instantly. It takes little to no imagination to do it to the point where there's still some gacha kind of elements in it where you can just <laughs> buy coins to buy characters and get new weapons. It's just, it's a really strange game which has been optically optimized for console in any way. But I wouldn't say I hated it. I, I kind of enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of the same. Like, as you said, it's really weird because it is clearly a mobile game. Um, but they seem to have also... 
like they've made it so those systems are still in the game, but they're completely not essential. You know, like you can spend money to buy coins to unlock new characters and stuff, but you'll never need to. Like you'll never ever need to do that. I, I don't know if this is maybe free to play on mobile and they, you know, they they sort of balance it in a way where you do have to do more of that stuff. But on the Xbox version, you you'll never need to spend money on anything. You just you'll be fine for the whole thing. And as you said, this is just the most paint by numbers RPG ever, but it's not actually like a bad you know it's it, it kind of it is a bad game but it's also quite reasonably enjoyable to play i would say like i find something infinitely satisfying about an rpg that tells you know a, an incredibly generic but full rpg story you know like you start off and you know you figure out the big evil thing and then you go off to different areas to to you know save the world it's all there in a game that takes like six hours and something about that's weirdly satisfying to me. I, I don't know. I quite like that. I've just completed this gigantic quest in like an afternoon. It's, it's, it's I don't know. It's, it's like a shameful kebab on a 2am <laughs> crawl yeah. home from the pub, isn't it? It's that kind of game. I mean, the combat is ridiculously deep. There's loads you can do with the combat here, but you don't need to. The game at no point actually there's a there's a weakness like a rock paper scissors elemental system at play here, and I never learned it. And I finished the game just by holding the right trigger and speeding through with generic attacks because you just don't need to learn anything. That's really odd, but it also means that everything happens so quickly. You go into a <laughs> battle and it's it's all uh, random appearances. You know, there's no walking yeah. into a fight, but it's over in three seconds, and you've got more experience points and you've gone up another level. And that little gamer feel like when a number goes up, you get that little adrenaline rush from it and on you move on. You know, there's the mobile elements back into it again. I mean, the world is so easy to traverse. Like you just go from point A, you can't get lost. It'd be impossible to get lost in this game. It's tiny. And yet it's also fairly boring. <laughs> there's nothing, <laughs> nothing special about this world. It's just a bunch of mountains and sea. That's it. It's just totally bizarre. Oh yeah, I mean they they clearly just took an early Final Fantasy game and went, let's just let's just do that, you know? No don't do anything for ourselves. Let's literally just make that kind of world and whatever, it'll do, you know. We don't need to populate it with anything interesting. And yeah, you know, I guess you didn't because I, I played the whole game and I left it being like, that was all right. <laughs> I didn't just, mind. You know, maybe everyone else is working too hard. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe maybe you just do this and it's fine. I, I don't know. It's the strangest thing, isn't it? It's obviously it's got this 8-bit, 16-bit NES, NES kind of look to it. It's an old yeah. school game. You know, the pixel art is fine. It's not bad. It's okay. You know, the characters look like characters. You know, the sound is fine. It loops the same song about a million times, but that's <laughs> that's just what old games used to do. So I'm, I'm kind of okay with that as well. The characters are kind of funny, kind of, in their own little way. It has this system where... You recruit team members just by talking to them once and they'll just be <laughs> recruited in. They don't need any convincing. There's a hundred people you can recruit to form these little armies which you take into battle with you, similar to like a Sui Coden kind of system. But they've done no work to flesh these characters out. One one character's just a crate. And <laughs> it's just, just, just mind boggling. Yeah. I recruited a set, I recruited a chest of drawers. And I was just like, <laughs> all right. And it's just, just totally bizarre. But let's be honest, when it comes to all Vastia Chronicles, the gameplay doesn't matter. The world doesn't matter. The story doesn't matter. The interesting thing about this game is how mm. utterly fucking weird it is. And it's <laughs> yeah. all entirely down to your lead protagonist named Alan. Yep. Yep, good old Alan. So yeah, I mean, this is a game that is, as we said, it's ape in Final Fantasy. It's a traditional fantasy world full of magic and warriors. And everyone else has, you know, fantasy names. And then you're just Alan. You're just, you're just Alan for no apparent reason. It's it's absolutely ludicrous. And I just love that, like, you know, it starts at you being Alan and then the game just gets weirder from there. It's it's great. I also kind of, this is it's just an odd thing because obviously lead protagonists in a lot of RPGs are mutes. As in, you know, you're meant to put your own personality on them, choose their own uh, dialogue options. But Alan is literally a mute. It was a traumatic <laughs> incident in his life, and now he can't talk. And so to talk, he scribbles furiously on a piece of paper in a motion that makes it look like he's furiously masturbating <laughs> rather than writing yeah, anything really down. Does. Never fails to make me laugh. And it's just utterly bizarre. And it's topped off with this weird as heck relationship he has with his sister Elmia 
who they quite clearly want to be together. And not just yeah. in a brother sister platonic kind of way. I mean, there's some serious incestuous vibes going on here. Oh God, yeah, to the extreme. Like it's it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you know, being that Elmi is someone who can actually talk, she just spends every every line of dialogue talking about how much you know she basically wants wants Silent Alan. And, you know, Alan doesn't talk, but he, he sure does furiously masturbate a lot. So, you know, so there is that. But uh, it's just so weird. Like, it's because it's the kind of entire hook of the story. Like, it's the, the, the main <laughs> point of this game is that these two siblings, like, want a bang. That's pretty much, like, everything <laughs> is centered around that in this game. And it's just, and the game is, like, it's proud of it, to be honest, isn't it? It's not It's not like, oh, let's let's just put this in the corner of the story. Like, no, nah, they, they're very proud of what they've achieved here for whatever reason. I just was waiting the entire time for them to accidentally find out other oh, not related. Yeah, and yeah, now same. they can be all the way through the game, all eight hours. I was waiting for them to go. Oh, it turns out we're not related. I love you, Alan. He says nothing. He furiously scribbles in his pad of paper, and that's it. We move on with our lives. But it never came. Ah. They just they just kept leaning further and further into it to the point where I thought, have I accidentally picked up a piece of erotic fan fiction, <laughs> which has managed. Because Kemco at this point producing so many games, they're not even checking the scripts. And somebody's just put in a secret love letter to their sister because it's <laughs> utterly bizarre that at no point did they debunk it. Is this a translation issue? Did they, did I, no, I, I, I strongly don't think it is. I mean, I think this is literally just what the game is. And I think what's really funny as well is like, because this makes it an even more awkward fit to be an Xbox Game Pass. But it also just tells me that like, I don't believe a single member of the Xbox team played this game. <laughs> like, <laughs> not even one of them has played this, surely, because it just, I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's just a little bit off-brand for what they would maybe want to be, uh, you know, they probably don't want to be telling everyone to to shag the sisters. So, um, you know, a bit weird, but uh, yeah, just just very odd. And um, they, they, I remember you were, you were saying as well, I totally forgot this, but they have these like, every character has a list of like things they like and dislike, right? Yeah. And, and Alan's Alan's likes is just his sister. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just like, in case it wasn't already blatant enough what is happening, like, there you go. I mean, uh, to give it credit though, it's creepy and it's weird, but it's kind of funny. And it oh, kept yeah. me going all the way through. Like the game is kind of funny and i don't know why i don't know if i'm so broken by this challenge and broken by the fact i had to play our bastia chronicles but i laughed at this more than many games which are actively trying to make me laugh it's kind of enjoyable <laughs> you've got another character who wants to ban somebody else in the team and all yeah. he ever does is talk about that and he runs he's the ladies man of the group and it's kind of funny and i don't yeah, know why great. the whole thing the whole thing is so weird and so out there and so preposterous that it kind of kept me playing. It kind of made me want to know what happened. You also yeah. have the option to choose the odd dialogue option for Alan. And you just pick the creepiest, weirdest <laughs> option every time. <laughs> like you, can, you get to name the boat which they build for you and you can like name it the HMS Victory or whatever. And you just call it Elmir is the best. Because of course you do. It's because <laughs> that's what Alan would say. The yeah. weird little bastard. <laughs> that's what he was. <laughs> of course, yeah. You gotta you gotta role play Alan properly. And uh and yeah, as you said, just yeah, super weird game. But I agree. I I I found this quite fun, you know. It feels like it's just like clearly with them churning out so many games, this thing is just like written in an afternoon, right? Just someone just loot someone just sat there just making loose notes of like, I don't know, screw it. We've got this ladies man, he's gonna say this and that. And I don't know, there's there's the odd bit of fun in there. I actually, you know, I, I quite like some of that. And I mean, again with the weirdness as well, there's a point in this game where they use the actual game itself to tell you to go and review the game. <laughs> like, yes. like that's absolutely crazy again it's a, a symptom of it being a mobile game but they'll have the characters just talking about it and it's just it's just ridiculous yeah, the, just the whole thing is kind of ludicrous and if that's enough to get you through it then it's a fairly short game it's only six to seven hours you can basically play through it without even thinking most of the time and you just get to experience this weird story about incest which has somehow managed to sneak its way onto Xbox Game Pass, despite the fact any management of take. What were you thinking, Phil Spencer, you creepy bastard? Why would you <laughs> let this go onto the service? I, I don't understand. But, I mean, I can't look. In any good conscience, I can't give this game more than a five. It's, it's not a good video game. It's not particularly fun. It's the most bare-bones, by-the-numbers JRPG you'll ever play. 
But in terms of enjoyment, I could possibly give this a seven or an eight because I kind of <laughs> liked it. I mean, it's it's terrible, but maybe it just suits broken people like myself. Yeah, because it's I, I I've played more you know more authentically good games which i've enjoyed far less than this dumpster <laughs> fire of a title which somehow managed to sneak its way onto this service yeah i mean i share quite a lot of your, your sentiments there like this game is absolutely trash like it's not it's not a good game by any stretch um but at the same time like if we weren't you know kind of chained to completing about 480 game pass games i could see a world where i'd go on to my like phone and check the check the app store and be like oh, i might get one of those chemco games and just tr- just trudge through it in my spare time because again there's just a kind of complete shut your brain off level of simplicity to these games you know you you get to just play an easy game not even really think about it and like seven hours later you've saved the entire planet like it's actually weirdly satisfying so yeah i mean i kind of i agree with you that in terms of fun i actually was more at like a seven or an eight for this um i'd give it a six i've been a bit more generous than you but it's undoubtedly trash like i feel sorry for some of the bigger games that i've gave under a six because they now have to live with the fact that alvastia is above them but uh but that's where i am i don't know it's it's a weird stupid fun game Play it at your own risk, but, you know, maybe give it a go? I, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to a game which you probably should play before it goes. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Now, if you're thinking, God, that sounds like a Castlevania title, that's because this basically is a Castlevania game. This was a Kickstarter created by the Castlevania creator Koji Igarashi, who has been refused by Konami to create a new Castlevania game. So he fobbed them off. And he went to make his own huge Kickstarter, massive amount of money raised. This is the game that came out of it. Does it live up to those Symphony of the Night kind of vibes that it's so desperately trying to recreate? Yeah, I mean, I just said, yeah, this is really, really leaning heavily towards uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night back on the PS1. I mean, it shares like there's loads of sound cues in this game, like when you pick up items or like find a power up. It sounds identical. Uh, the soundtrack is entirely, entirely the same vibe. It plays the same way. And, you know, largely I do think it lives up to that game. I mean, this is really, really good stuff. Um, I think that it's interesting because we've played a lot of games. I mean, obviously Metroidvanias in particular are just overblown at this point. You know, everyone releases one. But I think when I played this game, I noticed a real difference between people who want to try to be Castlevania and people who actually did make Castlevania. Like, there's just something wholly more authentic about Bloodstained than there is to... You know, for example, we played uh, that Momodora game uh, recently, Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight, because all these games, again, use that forward subtitle to pretend to be Castlevania. And that game is very much an imitation. This isn't. This is this is the guy who made Castlevania saying, I'm, I'm making more Castlevania. It just doesn't have the name on it because Konami hate games. And, and I do think <laughs> it holds up. I really do. Yeah, the, the biggest compliment you can play Bloodstained is it feels like a Castlevania game. And, you know, everybody speaks nowadays about how Metroidvania is a dominant genre and they're everywhere. But most of them don't really play either like Super Metroid or Castlevania. They kind of go in the middle of the formula. This is very much Castlevania. It's very RPG heavy. It's very much health bars and magic ups and potions. It's all there. It's just a, me- it's just a mess of menus in the way that all the Castlevania games kind of used to be. Just have these massive sprawling maps for you to explore as well. And it captures all that. As you say, the sound design is completely on point. So a lot of the old composers from Konami's staple of Castlevania composers came back to create music for this game, and you can tell. And moreover, it's got that weird charm to it, which these sort of games often miss. This game is weird in tiny little moments. It's got lots of strange little references to other games. Shovel Knight turns up for example, for (laughs) absolutely no reason. There's a wonderful touch where all the developers are paintings which fly off the wall to attack you. And everyone's dressed in gothic clothes. I love that as well. You know, it's just a strange little title where you take a break from hunting Dracula to go plant rice. I mean, it's (laughs) that kind of game. And I kind of like it for that. I like its odd quirks. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, as you said, it's it's exactly in the same way Castlevania used to do that sort of stuff. You know, the, the main quest is very high stakes. You know, it's this evil entity is going to ruin the world. But then also at the same time, you've got like weird little side content to do. Like, you know, 
someone wants to cut your hair or someone wants you to plant some rice and it's all, you know, someone's lost a ring and you need to go and find it somewhere. And, you know, you do all that stuff and maybe they help you get kind of new items or more powerful skills. And it all just flows nicely into the, the, the kind of main Castlevania type experience here. And, you know, yeah, it's just it's just a fun time. And I think um, as well, the the combat in this is, is really good stuff, as you would expect, because it's it's a Castlevania game. But but yeah, it's much tighter than a lot of the kind of imitation games we've played. Um, and yeah, I just, I enjoy playing it a lot. Yeah, the combat's interesting in this game. There's a lot of weapons to pick from. Like you're constantly finding and picking up new weapons and they all play slightly differently. You can play with like a ranged pistol if you want to, or you can get the old Castlevania whip on the go if you want that as well. Most players are probably going to pick up a quick moving sword and just slash yeah. at people, and it's probably the best way to play it. But it's a pretty satisfying combat system. It's very basic. There's not much to it. You just strike across or slightly down. That's about it. You know, that's all you can do. Yeah, but- no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, these games are always more about using that. You know, you, you get a simple arsenal of moves, but then it's like, you know, you find the right time to to strike and then you know maybe you have to like do a back step to dive backwards away from the next hit from the enemy or you know cast one of your magic spells to to sort of defend or something and it's kind of all the systems put together it, it does work really well yeah and it, it kind of flows together nicely and as you mentioned the magic spells you gain them they're called shards in this game and every time you defeat an enemy there's a chance you'll pick up their special move which mm-hmm. is given by this giant shard of glass literally stabbing your character <laughs> through their chest and they absorb the power. Kind of love that. That's kind of strange. But from mm. that, you can do all sorts of weird stuff. You can summon lightning. You can summon a giant tentacle. You can summon a big rat. I mean, there's just loads yeah. of weird stuff which you can just use at your disposal with your magic mm. points. They perhaps take up too many points so you can quickly use up your arsenal before you've even really done much in the way of damage. But as in all Castlevania games, all you need to do is destroy a couple of candlesticks and you'll have to quickly <laughs> yeah, rebuild course. again because that's just how these games play. And it's a pretty satisfying combat system. It's pretty fun. Helped even more so by some really good enemy design. There's some really cool monsters which you fight in this game. Like there's a what 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 type of dog is it? You're more of a dog guy than I am, but there's like this tiny, cute little white-headed dog, and it's really fluffy and adorable, <laughs> but it's also a severed floating dog head. <laughs> oh god, yeah, I remember that. I mean, sadly, I'm I'm a bit kind of uh struggling with some details on this one because I played this as soon as it came into Game Pass because I was looking forward to it. So I don't remember the specific enemy designs, but I can picture that in my head. Yeah, just this adorable dog, except for it's a floating head that's going to bite you. It's and, just, yeah, great. And there's just loads of that. There's like a cat enemy as well, which is just huge. And you just slash at this cat to take it down. As I mentioned, Shovel Knight turns up apropos of nothing. Really cool. There's just a lot of really fun enemies to fight. It keeps it pretty vervid. And as you keep fighting more people, you keep leveling up. The more you level up, the more health you get, the more damage you can do. And you very much need it because the first hour or two of this game is a bit of a struggle in the way that old Castlevania games used to be. You know, it's it's not easy to make progress at the start. You'll be thinking, Christ, when is the next save point? I need one. And they don't turn up as frequently as you want. But once you do level up, once you do have the skills at your disposal... This is a really fluid and fun game and a fun world to explore. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, this game, as you said, it has like a bit of a bit of an early skill check where, you know, it could be very easy to just put it down and go, nah, it's, it's too much for me. I mean, early on, you fight a, a samurai guy who is, uh, is voiced by David Hitt, who is uh, famous for being Solid Snake. So, you know, you fight, you fight the Solid Snake samurai man. And that guy just kicked my ass like 20 or 30 times in a row when I first started this game. And I just, I just couldn't quite get, figure out what I was doing wrong. And, you know, in the end, it was just a case of learning his patterns and knowing when to avoid attacks. You know, it wasn't anything too complex, but it can seem early on like this game's going to be a bit overwhelming. And I'd implore people to power through that because it does get a lot easier. You know, as you get further in the game, you start to... I mean, the save points are always distanced about the same way, but you start to naturally play the game at a faster pace, I think. So, Mm. you know, like standard enemies become a bit of an afterthought to you because you know how to deal with someone like that or you know they're only going to survive one or two hits from you. So you do actually get to save points more often, even though they're the same distance away. And I I think that helps a lot. Yeah, that's definitely, that's just good game design, to be fair. That's just you learning how to attack enemies so that when you go back and you start exploring more, they pose little to no threat. People who I dreaded, coming across in the early game. Now I can just take down in a couple of hits. And that's really satisfying. That's something that I complained about Momodora, how 
from the start to the end of the game, I didn't really feel any more powerful. Mm. I felt the same. You don't get that in Bloodstained. You feel considerably more useful the further into this castle that you go. And it is a huge castle. Eager, who is the developer, has said it's his biggest castle yet. And it very much is. There's a lot to explore here. You know, you won't discover everything unless you're an absolute secrets hoarder. You don't just smash at every single wall to see which one crumbles in the old-fashioned way that these things do. It's just a deeply fun and satisfying game to play. I, I kind of enjoy this a lot. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. I mean, the castle is is fantastically designed. As you said, it is absolutely huge. It's got that typical thing where you'll go through like you'll you'll kind of clearly leave an area and enter another area and the theme will just change to like an extreme degree. But like it's just it's it I like that. It's kind of great. You know, you'll go from like some creepy, like acid filled underground area to like suddenly you're in an incredibly posh library and you know, stuff like that. And it just it just every area nails that kind of gothic vibe the game's going for, but in a completely different way. So I'm a big fan of that. Um and also it's in typical kind of Castlevania fashion, they've got that thing where you can technically finish the game in a reasonable amount of time, you know, let's say 10, 10, eight to 10 hours or something, but that'll actually be like a kind of sucky ending that isn't really the true ending. And then if you like, if you actually get past that bit to go towards the true ending, you realize you've got a lot of game left. Like, you know, there is a huge area that you haven't even got to yet. And that's kind of great because if you're a fan of the game, there's, you know, here's more game. So yeah, just good stuff all around. It's really nice to see a proper Castlevania revival because, you know, a lot of those imitation games, they are really good, but, you know, it's just, it's a shame for these people that they've been kind of held back by Konami for so long, right? You know, they've wanted to make Castlevania and haven't had the option. And eventually they've just hit break and point and been like, you know what, we're just going to make a new franchise then. And, you know, I'm glad they did. I, I would love to see more of this come out in the future because I think that if there's any negative I have for this game, I would say that it's a little janky in places, you know, it, it doesn't, maybe doesn't run perfectly and it's maybe a little, a little, not buggy, buggy's harsh, but you know, there's just little things that, that grate on me a bit. And I think if they, you know, with the success they had with this game, I imagine they'll go all out for a sequel and I'd be very excited to play that. Yeah, I agree with that completely. This game does have some slightly buggy kind of janky elements, which hold you back a little bit. And that is a, that is a bit frustrating. It's, you know, it's the symptom of Kickstarter development. It's a symptom of a franchise getting started off the ground again. You know, there's no template to build from here. I think a sequel to this game is going to be real good. I, I don't doubt that entirely. I think this is a very good base point for this franchise to get better and better and better. But I do have issues with it. I find the main character's movement to be a little bit heavy, to be a little bit cumbersome. That's a little frustrating, especially when you're trying to get around the map. There's no like dash button, for example. You just kind of have to move around at the trudging pace. I also find it incredibly frustrating that there is a back step, but there isn't a forward roll. And that absolutely drives me mad in combat. That's something that this game could desperately do with because it's very easy to turn yourself the wrong way. And all of a sudden you're back stepping into somebody when actually you want to forward roll around. It just add a bit more fluidity, a bit more movement again to the combat system. I don't really know why it's not there. And finally, I'd say the fact that you don't actually know the boss's health points. I know there's a later power-up where you can actually then see what their health points are, but it comes so late in the game to be functionally useless. There's nothing worse than a boss fight when you don't know if there's 100 hit points left or 2,000. And you have no idea how much longer you should be sticking around or learning patterns for. That always irks me, and I don't quite know why it didn't. I don't think regular enemies need health bars, but I think you could have given them for the boss fights. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. I mean, I think a lot of those problems just come down to like, you know, you could argue that maybe they're going a bit too traditional with some things. Um, I mean, because mm. Castle, like the, the older Castlevania games, they they all just had the backstep, right? Like Symphony of the yeah. Night, you could only backstep. So I think they've stuck to that. But, you know, there is an argument to be made that, you know, maybe, maybe you know, we've, we've moved on now and people would expect a bit more of an ability to dodge around. Um, and I think you get the same thing with the health bars as well. I think they've literally just went... You know, like we've we've sold this game to people on the idea that we're bringing back like the golden era of Castlevania. So let's just completely buy the book, stick to it. And, you know, maybe maybe in a sequel, they won't be quite as constrained by that. And because I'd be happy to see those changes, too. I think, you know, it's just simple quality of life stuff, particularly the health bars. You know, it's it's just stuff that it'll get more people through the door and it won't particularly anger the people who are already there. So, you know, why not? 
why not do that? But I, I, on the whole, I think this is a real good game. I really, I've really enjoyed playing through this. I've only got the bad ending. I'm going to end up buying this game so I can eventually come back and play it to the true ending. Because, I mean, you know, I've got the Sodden Witcher free to play. I don't have time to put another four <laughs> hours into Bloodstained. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've enjoyed what I played of it. I'd say it's a solid seven. I'd maybe even creep to an eight. But I'd, I'd say it's a high seven for me. It's definitely a recommendation. One to check out. Yeah, I, so I gave this an 8 out of 10. Um, I, I just think it's great. If you've got any nostalgia for, like, again, Symphony of the Night on PS1, or even the... There's a fantastic set of Castlevania games across the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo DS. Um, if you played any of those games and enjoyed those at all, this is this is more of that. So, yeah, I'd say anyone that has any nostalgia for any of those games, just, yeah, this is... You're going to love this. So definitely give it a look. Okay, I'm moving on to our final game of the week, and this is Kona. Now, Kona, this is a first-person detective game, essentially. It's, a, it's on the verge of being a walkie-talkie, mm. choicey-makey game. Probably more walkie-talkie than choicey-makey. But what did you make of this? It's got an interesting setting, if nothing else. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, you know, so this game is set in uh, 1970s uh, Canada, and you know, it's a big, snowy, snowy landscape. You show up to this town as a detective, and... You know, you're there to try and figure out what what the hell happened there because, you know, there's somebody's... I think you go there because somebody's died. But then as you play more of the game, you realize that literally no one is in this town. <laughs> so that's... um that's I mean, I'd love to say that's a narrative element, but really I think it's just an excuse to not have to make people. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, that's that's the hook of this game here. Um, I was not expecting good things from this. This is not my kind of genre. Um the first time I tried to play it, I drove my car for five minutes. Um, it has this narrator man who voices over everything, who, for some reason, I just find him infinitely dull. He just has a really dull accent and dull way of speaking. And um, yeah, I played it for about 20 minutes, and then I, I turned it off and had a nap, because it, it made me so bored that I felt tired, so I actually just had to sleep for a bit. <laughs> but um, that was my first experience with Kona. But uh, but yeah, you know, I, I put it back on after that, and I've completed it this week. And I think it tries to do some good stuff, but I, I don't think it really works. It's a strange little game. I mean, you play as this lead detective. He's the kind of guy you've seen in a million full noirs. He's chain smoking. He's probably had a bad breakup. He likes a drink. All those sort of things which you kind of come to expect. You turn up in this sleepy town. The person you're there to meet has been murdered. What happened to him? How are you going to get paid? Off to the races. It's not, to be fair, a terrible setup. I don't mind that. I think that's a pretty good it's a pretty good hook to get into the game. And it also plays on its Canadian kind of wilderness by having a health survival meter, which you constantly need to be looking at. So you need to, you know, stay warm at all times. You need to make sure that you get it to a fire at enough points to stay warm so you don't freeze to death. It's, it's you know, it's a pretty good idea. But the problem with that is they kind of render it null and void almost instantly by packing this place full of fire lighters and fire starters to the point where you think that the prodigy probably lived there. And then following it up by the fact you get this big coat about halfway <laughs> through the game, which apparently just mitigates the cold entirely. This this move we one heck of a coat because you could just wear it for the rest of the game and you're just never cold again. So the good ideas they had with the survival elements, they kind of didn't have the confidence to see them through, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I so I hate survival elements anyway. Like as soon as I saw this game, I had like a heat meter and a health meter and also some sort of sweet weird sanity meter where your guy gets stressed out for some reason. I was like, oh no, because I just thought, you know, I I don't want this to be a game where, as well as me being a bit bored because this isn't my type of game, I'm also gonna like die because I got cold. But then as as you said, you kind of yeah, you quite think like, you you play about an hour of it, someone gives you a big ass coat, and then I I, I nearly got cold enough to die once but that was only because i sort of skipped about like there's about three times that i could have lit a fire but i thought ah screw it i'll, I'll keep going because I, I you know i i won't need to heal make myself warm until the next one and i pushed my luck a little bit too far but like i really could have stopped and used one of those fireplaces to heat up at any time there you know it's my own stupidity that led me to nearly die at that point but yeah i didn't die from any of the survival elements at all so considering i largely didn't care about them they they probably haven't worked very well because I, I wasn't focusing on them at all anyway. And, um, you know, yeah, look, this, this game, it's, it's, it, it does some things well, I think. It's got a quite a nice, like I said, the, the, the locale and the setup is quite nice. I do think it does a good job of having this, 
like appropriately sized open world area to explore. You know, it's like, cause you, you're not really given much to go on here. You get to this town and you're, you need to figure out what the hell happened. And you know, it's like, right, you've got your car, you know, you can fill it with gas at this station. And now, you know, you're free to go around and figure stuff out. And that could be quite overwhelming, but this map only really has about seven or eight points of interest that you could check out anyway. So even if you have nothing to go on, eventually you will stumble across something that progresses the story on. So that's that's fine. You know, I I, I like the, the appropriateness of how big it is. Um, it does do a couple of the things I hate the most about point and click games, because this does share a bit of their DNA. And it has that thing where someone might ask you for an item. And if you didn't pick up that item earlier, God forbid how you're meant to find it without looking it up online. You know, like it's, it's one of those things where like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I needed to make this man a drink to get his coat and I was meant to have um, picked up some wine from the shop or something. And I didn't see it there. And I, I had nothing to go on. I had no idea where I was going to find the item. And then I end up looking online. It's like, oh, you got to go move this ladder and climb up the shelf. And it's just, I don't know. Like if I, if I, I don't like the idea that, I, it should be a requirement that I load up a guide to figure that out because if I don't stumble upon it in the game, I'm literally not going to know where it is. You know, it's it's a bit, I don't know, just I, I don't think that was very well thought through. But on the whole, I, I didn't mind my time with this. Yeah, I mean, those elements are somewhat frustrating. I, I love the fact you have this car, which you just explore the world and it's actually quite fun. It almost becomes like a haven. You know that as long as your car's nearby, you're going to be okay which is kind of nice. It kind of makes it into a character in and of itself, which I think mm. is pretty fun. As you explore the world, you kind of like fill in more stuff on your map so you know how everything links together and where all the houses are and who lives there. And that's pretty cool. It took me two hours to realize I had a map, which was an absolute <laughs> disaster. It did mean I knew this town at the back of my hand because I just had to learn it, which was kind of funny. <laughs> but, you know, mm. that kind of came as well. There are those kind of points and click frustrations. Most of the puzzles aren't radically confused and if you're interacting with everything you're kind of gonna come across it eventually yeah. it's just one of those things it's just how long your patience holds out to you know be wandering in the dark essentially and on occasion mine just went i just just tell me where i need to go and then i'll get on with it and, you know there's elements of that and that's kind of annoying because in a detective game you don't want to be just stood shrugging your shoulders going oh, i don't know that, yeah. that's, that doesn't make you yeah. feel like the world's greatest detective but all of it, it all kind of comes together well enough. I mean, the combat is awful. I oh, it's dreadful. It. Yeah, there is there is the capability for combat, but it's so bad that you just should never use it. There's an achievement for not using any weapons or doing any violence in this game, and the chances are you'll get it because you can't do anything. You shooting's a nightmare, <laughs> punching's a nightmare. So you might as well just sod and run away from everything. It's the only way to play this game, in my opinion, because it is awful. It's combat systems. Yeah, no, they are some of the some of the weaker combat systems I've ever seen from a, a, a 3D like a, a game like this. I just think everything feels bad. I mean, I even think getting away from even the combat. I think actually just controlling the character feels pretty awful. There's something about the turning in this game that I don't know what it is, but it's just something's too sharp about it. And even messing around with the sensitivity settings didn't help because then that just made it way too slow. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but something about this character's movement just completely was off to me. I I, I don't know. So I didn't like that as a, anyway. And then you put a gun in your hands and then it's just, it just elevated to be even worse. So yeah, it's got its issues with that, but luckily you don't need to do a ton of that beyond a couple of wolves you know you, you might need to scare them off with a gunshot or maybe just hit them with an axe or something and that'll be all the fighting you need to do so thankfully it does does end pretty quickly on that on that side but um but yeah you know it's yeah this this game's a tricky one to judge really because i think that even though it sets up a good atmosphere and the town itself and the different the houses to go around i think that's well well set up well designed i i came out of this in the end just being completely left cold and disappointed by what they chose to what they chose to use as the ending and the overall story of this game. I feel like they they set up a cool kind of noir, moody, snowy area, and then they just go, eh, I don't know, let's do supernatural stuff. <laughs> and it just kind yeah. of sucks. Yeah, that this is a big thing because the story in this game is, as I mentioned, it has a good setup, but it does two of my least favorite things in detective fiction. The first is to have a town be mysteriously absent of anybody in it. 
that is just poor set because then you have nobody to interact with. It means you don't yeah. have any dialogue options. It means you don't talk to anybody. It's a very convenient way to avoid writing dialogue because now all you can do is pick up law and pick up diaries and read where people were. It's much mm. easier to do that than to write a convincing scene between two characters where you need to get information out of them. So it's lazy and it's annoying. That's my one of my least favorite things about detective fiction. My second least favorite thing is shit turns into the supernatural, apropos of completely <laughs> nothing yeah. and completely unearned. This game, it's not much of a spoiler to say it does because it hints at it from the very start. Mm. And I spent my entire playthrough going, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> and it inevitably got closer and closer to doing so. And this game culminates in an anticlimax so hilariously <laughs> bad, I just sat there laughing. It is a. It has the worst ending in a video game I yeah. think I may have ever played. I, I'm not. No, it's that's... not an exaggeration to say it. it is legitimately hilariously bad. <laughs> I honestly don't know what was going through their minds. Uh, it's it's just mind boggling. If if you've ever fought in a horror movie, why don't they just turn and run away and just leave? Well, now you'll know why. <laughs> 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 yeah, Coda Coda's story just shits itself inside out by the time yeah, it is. It just I mean, ruins all the good setup it had. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. That I like I was gonna go as extreme as saying that it's near enough the worst ending I've seen in a game as well. So I'm glad you're on the same page. I think it's absolutely dreadful. The entire closing 10 minutes of this game, where it decides to suddenly be like a shit action game and do a stupid ending. I just I felt like I was just sat there just just shaking my head at it. I was like, really? I mean, I already wasn't that enamored with the game, but that was about as bad as it could have got for an ending too. So yeah, just infinitely disappointing. I think if this game could have wrapped its whole story up in a really satisfying way, I might be telling people to maybe have a go at it before it leaves. You know, it'll only take you about five to six hours, maybe. Um, you could cut that down a bit if you get a bit liberal with guide usage. You know, so there might have been a world where I'd say, oh, you know, give it a look. It's a, a bit of a, you know, a curious little unique title. But I could, I would never tell anyone to to seek this out and inflict that ending upon themselves. It's completely pointless. You'll just feel like you've wasted your time. I, I, there's a joy maybe in the badness of it. I'd say that you know you can <laughs> you can sacrifice four hours of your life, two of which you'll probably quite enjoy because it's okay for the first half of the game. It only completely wrecks itself in the second half of the game. If you're the kind of person who can watch a TV show or a movie go completely off the rails and kind of enjoy it when it's mm. happening, you might quite like Kona. It has that kind of vibe to it of just something that got completely out of hand and <laughs> nobody knew how to fix it and it was dead ruined before they could do anything to it. It kind of sets up a sequel which will never happen as well. So that's satisfied as well. Yeah. Look, it, it's a perfectly adequate game to while away an afternoon. If you find yourself bored this next weekend, maybe boot it up. It'll only take four hours to beat. But I'd, I'd struggle to recommend it. I will say, and it's the strangest praise I can give it, I love the font of this game. <laughs> It has a wonderful font, which it liberally loses for all of its names and size. It's just beautiful. It's this big yellow, bold font, and I love it. So great font, average game. I'd say a five out of ten. Yeah, that's fair. I, I don't mind the font, but I do find it stupid and annoying that like that I press on items and it just puts font in the world. You know, like just puts <laughs> words in the world for some reason. That's that's weird. And again, it's another it's another way to not put any dialogue in your game. You know, just just put stuff on the wall, make diaries, don't make people. It's yeah, there's there's weird laziness to this. Um, I I kind of agree. I think if you like these kind of games, I mean, I very much don't. But if I if if you like, you know, a kind of slow pace, like figure out what's happened in the world. You know, walking sim to an extent, but there is things to figure out. You might enjoy the first couple of hours. And you might find the ending so funny that it still feels worth your time to to do it. But it's not something I'd be recommending particularly. Um, I, I still gave it a five. I don't think it's awful. I just I just think it's not for me and and there's not that much about it that redeems itself. All right, then. So let's close out this week's show with a bit of news. So we've got a few stories this week and a bit of a non-story from the world of uh, Xbox that we will talk about. So let's start this up then with uh, we're getting a lot more rumors now about the Nintendo Switch Pro that may actually happen. You know, there's been a lot of, a lot of rumblings about this over the years, but nothing's really stuck. You know, there's been no real 
hard information on what was going to happen. Whereas now we're actually starting to hear that realistically they they have gone as far as to have a screen ready to be manufactured for this console. So yeah, the reports are basically saying that they're planning on making the Switch Pro have a seven inch screen, which is it's a it's an improvement, but it's a small improvement. Um, for reference, the current Switch has a 6.2 inch screen and the Switch Lite has a 5.5. So, you know, it's it's bigger, but it's not necessarily like you're going to look at it and think that this is huge. Um, this is also still a 720p screen, which is what the resolution of the current Switch screen is. Uh, the only real difference here is that this is a Samsung um, OLED screen, whereas the current Switch uses an LCD screen. So, that's kind of better, better screen tech. Um, the simple version of this basically is that LCD just has like a light behind the screen to light things up, whereas on an OLED screen, every pixel can emit its own light. So it's like it's it's a it's a higher quality screen, which is nice. Um, but I think a lot of people were clamoring for a higher resolution screen from this, so they might be left a little disappointed. Um, and the other DL we have, which frustratingly this is the one we all care about but there's no information on it yet is that apparently this is going to have 4k output when it's docked but again there's literally nothing about that yet it's it's one of the more frustrating um reveals of a, or leaks of a console i've seen because there's a heap of information about the bit i don't care about <laughs> and, then, and then it's just oh and also it'll be 4k but uh yeah how are you feeling about this switch pro at the moment josh the switch pro is a weird one isn't it because we, the Switch celebrated its fourth birthday, I think, this past week. So it's not been out that long. So you'd think in three years' time, it's probably going to come up for replacement. I wonder if now is the time to be releasing a pro version of this console, when maybe I'd just rather its console lifespan came to an end in two years' time instead, and they just went all out on a new version of the Switch. I, I, what am I going to get out of three years of a Switch Pro, which will then just get replaced by a different Switch Pro? Mm. It, it's going to have such a short lifespan, and it's going to be so underused because everything still needs to work on the regular Switch that I, I don't quite see what the point is. I mean, it sounds better. The OLED screen, I love. You know, the idea that I can play games at 4K output when docked, pretty cool as well. I mean, don't get me on, I'll buy one because I'm a fucking idiot. Oh, God, yeah, but me too, of course. I, do I need <laughs> one? Probably not. I, I don't really see why I should have, or I'd have to pick this up. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that it's going to be interesting to see how Nintendo choose to market this. You know, it's, it's worth noting that this is all, you know, leaks so far. So, you know, Nintendo haven't really had an opportunity to speak their part of, you know, why this is an essential machine for people to buy as you said idiot cycles we're going to buy this day one anyway because that's what we do but you know they're going to need to do some work to really sell what this is you know like is this just uh, an xbox one x um, ps4 pro kind of deal where it's just you know if you want to stretch that generation out and get slightly better graphics for a year or two you can buy it or are they going to try and be more of a you know are they going to go for the angle of you know this is this is the main platform for the next you know, half decade and we're really going to push that this is the main one now, but also you can still use your Switch. Like, it's tough to tell at the moment. Um, you know, the Switch has been so wildly successful for them and it's still selling so well that I don't think they'd want to just completely end that kind of, you know, those sales right now. There's still more people who will buy a regular Switch. So I don't know if they necessarily want to be like, you know, we're going to abandon that. Where do you know, you, you now need to buy this new one. So yeah, I, a lot of the signs point towards this being a bit of an underwhelming release for me. Uh, but at the same time, I will absolutely get it. There's no doubt about that. Um, I'm not even that bothered about the 4K output. I just hope that this machine can maybe just, you know, maybe just the boost in power can uh, make some of the games that run a bit bad hmm. run better. You know, like I'm actually completely okay with my Switch being a 1080p machine. I'm not that bothered, but I do need my games to run better. Like, you know, I'm, like Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, for example, that game is in some bigger levels, it, it struggles, you know, it chugs along. And I'd like, I'd like that Nintendo smoothness from all of my games on the console, you know, like even, uh, I mean, I say Nintendo smoothness as if all of their games are smooth, but they've got stuff like Link's Awakening. Link's Awakening, yeah. Mess too, <laughs> you know, but everything else, I mean, you know, like your Mario Odysseys and stuff, you know, they, they run beautifully, but yeah, the, even Nintendo have struggled with this console a bit, which isn't something that usually happens. You know, they they usually manage to work magic with any machine they make. But if even they have struggled with the Switch, then it probably does need a new one. Um, but yeah, look, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, I hope that they market this really well and have a really sensible reason for making it. Because, I mean, I saw in the in the leaks that 
that it, the leak suggested that Nintendo think that the bigger screen will push a big chunk of holiday sales. And I, I'm sorry, I just don't think a 6.2 inch screen going up to a seven is is the big push for holiday sales. I just don't know if that's, you know, sure, you'll get some sales from like, look, it's a new model, but I don't think people are like, oh, thank God I've got 0.8 inches more screen. I just I, don't think that does a lot. I don't know. When you, when you add it to a handheld, it, it's amazing the difference it makes. You, like when you pick up a phone with a 0.8 inch bigger screen, yeah. you can really tell That's that true. thing is bigger. It, it, it's, it's subtle, but it's noticeable. I mean... If this becomes like a good way to, I mean, to be honest with you, can they just fix the Joy Cons? And I'll probably just buy it for that. <laughs> but you know, it's if this becomes a good way to future-proof my Nintendo Switch game, so that decades on the line, I can just play these games as well as they could on this gorgeous OLED screen. That might be enough for me, as long as they don't yeah. make too many big promises. Like the new Nintendo 3DS, for example, it's a great console. I own one. I basically okay. got it just for its stupid face plates, but. <laughs> It, they never did anything, so I think two or three games came out for that console, and they kind of pushed the idea that they may develop for it, and nobody yeah. did, because of course they didn't. It's a split market base. You can't. People are always going to develop for the weaker console. So, it, you know, it depends what they push it as, and it also depends what the pricing is. I, I ain't going to pay 400 quid for a Switch Pro. It kind of needs to replace the Switch, in my opinion. It's like, now the Switch is 50 quid cheaper, and you can pay what you pay for a Switch now for a Switch Pro. But yeah, we'll see. That's reasonable. I mean, I'll, I'll probably just pay whatever they ask for. <laughs> you know, it's just the way these <laughs> things go. But um, but still, I hope that they've got some cool stuff on, um, you know, coming up for it. I mean, the thing with the screen that bothers me is that, as far as I can tell, they they you know they're stuck to the Joy Cons at this point. Joy Cons are going to stick around, despite the fact they literally don't work. You know, they they have obviously the horrendous drift issues that they're, they're, they're just a car crash of a controller type, but they are stuck to them to the point where as far as I can tell, this seven inch screen is literally just going to be removing that kind of black bezel that's around the current switch model, you know, hmm. so the full, the full switch you're holding will be screen and, you know, sure, I guess that's fine, but that's, I think that's why I don't see it being a particularly like, inc- like impressive improvement because you're still kind of holding something that's the same size. It just got a bit less bezel around the edge, but yeah. I don't know. I I'd love the I'd love if they threw the joy cons out. It's it, there's literally 0% chance of it happening, but you know, everyone knows joy cons suck, right? Like it's, it's just one of those things. Like I, I barely even play handheld mode on my switch anymore because I'd rather use a pro controller that much that, you know, it's just not appealing to me to play switch. I, I play more <laughs> 3ds handheld than I do switch handheld at this point. It's just ridiculous, but yeah, I mean, we'll see. Hopefully they, hopefully they, they have some good messaging. All right, then moving on, let's talk Xbox with some non news here. Um, so yeah, this week there was a lot of buzz around um, Elden ring, the, the game coming up from uh, from soft, which, you know, got announced years ago and, has what might be the most rabid fan base on the internet at this point. Those guys will <laughs> grab anything they see. You know, you can show them a single single screenshot of something that might not even be Elden Ring, and they'll make like a book of law about that screenshot. It's they're they're, they're crazy. You know, they they want that game, and yeah. So the, in response this week to a kind of off camera leaked bit of Elden Ring footage coming out, people immediately theorized that that will probably be shown off at an upcoming uh, Microsoft event, you know, to show off all the big stuff coming from Xbox because, you know, we've had our Nintendo Directs, we've had our Pokemon Presents show, we've had a PlayStation State of Play, you know, just makes sense, doesn't it? You know, Xbox need to tell us what they're doing next. Um, But anyway, so head of marketing at Xbox, Aaron Greenberg, who, you know, he's he's a high up at Xbox, he knows what's going on. Um, He tweeted to basically shoot down that rumor. Um, He basically said to people in response to them saying about the um, Elden Ring reveal coming at a Microsoft event, he said, uh, just to set expectations, this is not happening. Uh, There are always things we have in the works, but there's nothing coming soon that would feature game announcements or world premieres like this. So, I mean, obviously that's not much of a news story on its own, but I've included it here because I think we need to talk about this. I mean, Xbox's output just... It's not been good enough, right, so far. I mean, we're five months now into these consoles. We're, we're you know, we're edging towards the fifth, fifth full month of them being out, and the messaging is just radio silent, right? I mean, I, I don't know if you feel any differently to me, but they really do need to have one of these events coming up soon. I, I mean, I find the the launch of this console to be just infuriating. 
I mean, consoles will always have iffy launches. The first year is always usually the slowest year. The Switch being a very rare disproval of that rule. Most of the time, you buy a console at launch, it's functionally pretty useless for a year. But the Xbox Series S doesn't even have a Microsoft published game for it yet. It's their own console. Like that, this is mind boggling that you don't have your development teams working to the launch of this console. What have they been doing? Like they know it's coming out. It's not like it's a hit. It's not like Xbox or bloody hell. I didn't realize we had our own console coming out. They've known for the best part of four <laughs> years what date this was coming to. You can't yeah. even blame the pandemic for this. They've had years to build games ready for this console launch and they've got nothing and they've got nothing for the next three months and the next three months after that. The only game we've got announced is Halo Infinite, which is functionally an Xbox One game anyway, yeah. a year later down the line. And that is mind-boggling. I mean, Sony's launch has been indifferent, but at least it launched with Demon Souls. I mean, it's a remake, but it's a ground-up remake yeah. for That's that fair. console. They've got Returnal. I may not care about Returnal, but it's a new game for that console. They've got Ratchet and Clank coming out. Miles Morales, at least, is a new game. I mean, there's at least something there. Sackboy, yeah. for God's sake. At least yeah. something launched with it. Even the, Xbox... I mean, even Destruction All-Stars, right? I mean, it's yeah, a small-time you know. game, but came to PS Plus. You know, everyone got that for free. As you said, yeah, Ratchet coming up. There's They've at least said that games like Horizon Forbidden West is meant to be coming this year. They they announced God of War for this year, even though everyone thinks it's not going to happen. You know, they, they have stuff in the pipeline. And yeah, as you said, Xbox just... There's nothing going on. I mean, as far as we can tell right now, we're going to get um, an Xbox version of Flight Simulator in the middle of the year, and then Halo Infinite at the end of the year, and, and that's it. And that is just not anywhere near good enough. Like, it's baffling to me, as, as you said, that, you know, they've known this is coming for a long time. It's insane that they have so many studios now that seem to be working towards... As far as we can tell, we're just assuming based on, you know, what, what we can figure out. Most of their studios seem to be working towards like a 2022 or 2023 release cycle, which is just, it's too late. Like something needs to be this year. No, this is it. Inside. I mean, how, how was none of these studios working on something for this year? I, I don't even understand how it happens. How wasn't there a new Forza game coming out to launch with this console? Like they, they know it's going to launch. They know they're going to make a Forza game for it. Why not just start development early on that game? I, <laughs> I don't understand it. It makes little to no sense to me. I mean, it's not like it's a game which needs ground-up work doing on it. It's highly iterative. You just pick a new location and, you know, get to work. If you give them enough time, they'd be able to hit launch. I, I just don't understand what they've been doing. And it, it's just bizarre to me and... Until they sort this out, this entire console is just pointless. You might as well just have an Xbox One. Like, yeah, it's, it's fair. And know. I think it's a shame too, though, because I, I do think that, like, you know, I mean, I, I have my Series X, I've got my PS5, and I, I love the Series X as a console. I think, you know, Real even good. even though, like, you know, these consoles, you know, the S and the X, they, they, didn't, they didn't excite us on day one because... Microsoft are keeping their ecosystem so seamless. You know, like you load them up and they have the same dashboard and you've got all your same games. But, you know, that that might be a bit dull on day one, but it's it's kind of fantastic half a year later because, you know, it's you've just got all of this stuff there. It all works perfectly. You've got stuff like Quick Resume that, that is, you know, working pretty much all the time now. You know, they're doing stuff to increase like frame rates and graphics quality and adding HDR to older games. All of that is genuinely fantastic. Like it makes you know, add Game Pass in as well. And the Xbox as a platform is the most consumer-friendly, you know, best place to play games in a lot of ways. But that doesn't mean you can't have new games. You know, that, that's not, it's not, a sub, it's not a replacement for not having any games. And it seems like, I, I don't know if they just banked too heavily on those kind of series, um, series X, series S updates for existing games at launch, because, you know, at launch, we got like patches for games like Gears and Forza that, that made them all, you know, more beautiful than ever but you know have they have they assumed that would kind of be a bigger drop in the ocean you know that people would be more content with that than they were because you know i mean we obviously we cover all the xbox stuff on our show and we didn't spend a lot of time on that stuff because everyone already played those games a year earlier you know like we're not gonna sit here and run down all the reasons why gears 5 is still gears 5 but prettier you know it's just not it's not newsworthy, sadly. And I don't know if they thought maybe that that would impress more people. But yeah, that's the only 
the only excuse I can try and make for them. There's there's no other, there's no other good ones. So yeah, it's all I've got. It's it's just very strange. I mean, we all know it'll get better. They've bought so many studios. The Bethesda acquisition will be a massive game changer. To use a horrible cliche for Xbox, it's gonna have gonna have a lot of games coming in the next five six years to be a series owner will be fantastic there'll be a lot of games coming to it whether there'll be any good who knows they've not been great at that part but you know the games will turn up i just find it very odd that we're looking at a solid 12 months before microsoft launches a new game to its own console i mean could you imagine if nintendo just released the switch and they just didn't release any games for it for a year People would lose their yeah. minds. <laughs> like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely it's wild. It's the kind of thing that only, like, you know, I mean, it, it, I guess it goes to show, like, how much kind of Xbox, the Xbox fan base has been beaten down over the Xbox One generation. But, like, <laughs> I'm annoyed by this, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel, like, abnormal, right? It feels like a pretty normal thing that's happening, but it's also rubbish. Whereas, like, as you said, yeah, if Nintendo brought out, like, the, you know, let's say go back to when the Switch came out. They're like, right, the Switch is coming out. I don't know. You can play some third party stuff on it. We we don't really have anything to tell you about right now. Like everyone would go insane. They'd be like, "What has happened?" Whereas with Xbox, you're just kind of like, "Yeah, sure, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, this is what's happening." <laughs> and that's that's really you know that's that's something they need to ch- like turn the tide on over the next kind of you know long term, like next four or five years. Like they need to shed that image because yeah, I I'm not surprised by this. I'm just I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> like a like an angry mum. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, that's what you don't are. make me an angry mum. I'm, I'm angry enough at my football manager, man. I don't need this Microsoft. <laughs> oh. Well, anyway, let's uh, let's let's move on and let's let's go bananas for a bit. So, uh, yeah, final piece of news here is basically, and we'll, we'll elaborate a bit more later. But basically, Sony are planning on letting you use a banana as a controller. Is the is, is the uh, the big picture story here? So, yeah, Sony have um, they've had some new patents going on lately, and one of the things they're working on is this idea that you could basically use anything as a controller. You know, like you don't need an actual controller with buttons. You could potentially use you know any object and then have a combination of, like have like a camera obviously looking at you or have some kind of ar elements that essentially mean you can use that object as a controller and the patent itself literally has pictures of bananas in it where there's like a banana and then another picture of a banana that has the playstation buttons in different places and the idea is that yeah if you don't have a controller as long as you've got some inanimate object around you can you can just use that it's pretty bonkers, isn't it? It just reminded me of the old PlayStation 3 design for the Dual Sense. Do you remember that? It literally looked <laughs> yeah. like a banana. So maybe they've just decided to take it one step further. They heard all the jokes. They've held on to the cruel jibes for the best part of 15 years. And now they're going, oh, you thought it looked like a banana, did you? Well, here's an actual <laughs> banana. That's going to be packaged with all your next-gen consoles. It's a funny, strange little story. It's a cool idea, to be fair to them. If this yeah. could ever work out, what a nice little uh, consumer-friendly policy by a by a company which isn't known for it. So <laughs> it makes a pleasant change. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm fine with it. You know, it's uh, it's it's got a lot of potential in terms of you know, it could it could help with with interactions for kind of for games that maybe don't need all the mechanics of a standard controller as well. You know, there's there's some simpler stuff. Um, I mean, some of the some of the other screenshots in the pattern show like people like painting on a screen by just moving the fingers around and stuff, you know, and yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm happy to see this kind of weird innovation. Um, I wouldn't expect to see anything actually come from it for a long time, but again, you know, the idea that you could, you know, cause I mean, let's be honest, game controllers are getting real expensive these days. You know, I, I love the idea that if someone came to my house and, you know, maybe, maybe we're playing like a free player game and I've only bought two dual sensors, I can just go like, well, Here's like a wooden spoon for my kitchen. Like, do your worst. You know, it's just it's kind of great. Maybe whoever's like losing the most in the game has to has to play with the wooden spoon for the next match or something, you know. So it's got a lot of uh, got a lot of legs. There's a lot to look forward to. I'm looking forward to the inevitable Gwen Stefani sponsorship with it as well. It's all gonna be good. Let's uh let's play some hollerback go. As we all play on our banana controllers, fantastic! <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, then that is uh, that's the end of the news this week. So we'll wrap up the show there. Um, until next time, if you want to catch us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Beat the Sheet. Uh, if you want to drop us an email, uh, give us some feedback, or um, ask us some questions, anything you'd like, really, you can find us at Beat the Sheet Podcast at gmail.com. 
And uh, yeah, so until next time, I am Andy Wood, and I am now at 68% complete on the sheet. I am creeping towards 70, hoping to get there in the next uh, couple of months, but we'll have to see what Game Pass brings. And my name is Josh Stevenson, and I remain on 57% of the sheet. And let's be honest, I'm only going to play The Witcher next week, so spoilers <laughs> for next week. Which I you won't even beat. Which I won't even beat, so, you know, uh, 57 basically for life. Absolutely. Right then, thanks a lot for listening this week, guys, and we'll catch you next week. Goodbye.